welcome to Varn Blog Special Supplement with Strange Matters Magazine. And if you want to follow along with the article that we're talking about today, or, I don't know, subscribe to Strange Matters Magazine, you can find it in the show notes. Already, it's already there. You don't even have to wait. Um, so, uh, I'm going to uh, caveat this with the fact that I'm recording this live, and this is actually under uh, less than optimal circumstances for me. But we are going to make the best of it tonight. Um, so I'm here with uh, John Michael Colon and Kyle Flattery um, of Strange Magazine Magazine. I guess you are both in the editorial collective in some degree or another. Yeah, we're, we're both editor owners of Strange Matters. Uh, and yeah, I've been there since day one. All right. Um so we're big fans here at Varn Blog, except for the word libertarian socialist, which makes us uncomfortable. Um, Inevitably, but... something does. <laughs> um, we're talking about one of my uh, great obsessions, particularly when I lived in the Norteño uh, region of Mexico about, oh, God, it's been a long time now, seven Where years ago, you? eight years ago. Where haven't you? I feel like I feel like you're always telling anecdotes about like oh yeah when I lived in like the mountains of so and so you know no I mean I only actually lived in four countries outside of the United States but um but I did live in Mexico and actually I lived uh, in Torreon Coahuila which um has strong ties to the Pancho Villaist and um is you know during Independencia and and and, and Revolution days we would be culturally is it culturally insensitive when you're being culturally insensitive to be culturally sensitive i don't know um <laughs> we would dress up like uh pancho villa and other people would dress up like indigenous like like indigenous people and yeah there you go um <laughs> i didn't do the latter because that was gross even for me but uh, it got me really interested in the mexican revolution because um I started studying uh, the Magon brothers, the Obrador family, um, uh, the differences between the, Zep the, the, the OG Zapatistas, not the current branch, um, and, and the Villaist, um, the attempt at the Grand Republic of the North, um, uh, probably where my favorite curmudgeonly reactionary author, um, Ambrose Bierce died. I mean, there's a whole lot to, to dig into. Also started becoming obsessed with the Chrysera War and the kind of interesting and strange position that a lot of the indigenous communities had during that conflict. Um, and I became really interested in it because I'm a leftist and um, except for anarchists trying to bring it up to own Marxists in a weird way, it never comes up. And, you know, we're in the United States and you would think the revolution right next door which really played into Mexican politics for good and for ill, as we will get into, um, in the creation of the of the Party of the Revolution, or the, later the Party of the Revolution Institutional, uh, or the PRI, um, and also uh, AMLO's legacy is actually tied back into this. So um, let's talk about it. First off, though, before we get into... The specifics. I'm just going to ask you a big, broad question now that I've gone on my four-minute rant. Um, why do you think we don't talk about the Mexican Revolution all that much? So uh, there's a there's a couple of things that are I think going on here, and um, I think part of it is uh, the kind of like most embarrassing and stupidest part of the answer is uh, American cultural cringe that Americans think that things that happen in Europe are more real and that Europeans are more sophisticated and, and meaningful and real than those of us in the Western hemisphere. Uh, and in particular, the, you know, we, we kind of need to have this, Americans need to exist on this hierarchy where uh, Europeans are sophisticated and uh, non-white people are barbarians and Americans have a kind of like Roman-esque alloying of, 
you know, these undisciplined barbarian hordes versus the sophisticated effete Europeans. Americans are the the good golden medium between those. And obviously that means we can't learn anything from those less sophisticated Mexicans. Uh, and this is why we're allowed to learn from the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution, but not from, you know, the Mexican Revolution or African revolutionary movements or the Nepali Civil War. Um, I think that also uh, I'm, I'm going to get I'd like to do a little uh, early summary of the Mexican Revolution for readers who might not be familiar with it. Readers, listeners who might not be familiar with the broad events. Uh, but it's also a rather complicated war. Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't partially just like the sheer events themselves are complicated, but also the end result of it isn't clean. It, you know, it would be like if the Mensheviks had an army and were still standing at the end of of the Russian Revolution. Yeah, for those people. Like, yeah, it, it's it's it like it, it ends in a weird way. It, it's awkward. Um, the faction that uh, most of uh, that is like like in retrospect appears the most unambiguously heroic uh, loses and loses for you know kind of shit reasons. Uh, you know, some reasons that make perfect sense, but also some reasons that don't fit easily into any sort of, like, coherent grand historical narrative. So I think it's a mix of, you know, American racism, American cultural cringe, uh, and the messiness and complexity of it. Um, and I also think that there's an element of, like, we want to learn from places that are more exotic and far off. Yeah. You know, so that's why the Chinese Civil War we can talk about a little more readily than the Mexican Revolution. Yeah, but say, even even uh, the the national liberations in Africa seem to be brought up more than the Mexican. Yeah, it's Republic, true. It absolutely, is. they absolutely are. Yeah. I also think that an important. Um, so I, everything Kyle said, I fully agree with, and in fact, I, I would be much less gentle than than Kyle is about the. Uh, what that was pretty harsh. <laughs> I know, I know, but you were, you were, but you, you know, you were very even handed in distributing the reasons. But overwhelming among all of them is just the, just enormous racist condescension of North mm. Americans towards the rest of the Americas because, it, and and that's like a long-standing thing. It goes back to like, you know, the old Manifest Destiny times, but then obviously accelerates, you know, in the 20th century with the, um, you know, with the, uh, the, the general kind of U.S. imperialist uh, uh, catastrophes of the, of the middle to late 20th century in Latin America. Um, but like, even leftists, I think, have this general idea that Europe is where history happens. And, you know, there's even like a kind of like Wallerstein story that you can tell about the core and the periphery where, you know, what happens in the core obviously affects the rest of the periphery too. And that's why the world wars are important. I'm not even against that up to a point. But the thing about a world system that's all interlinked is that something that happens on the periphery or the semi-periphery can have massive echoes everywhere else. Uh, and that is, in fact, what happened. Mexican Revolution. The Mexican Revolution in many ways inaugurated the age of revolutions. It wasn't just this random thing that happened separately, you know, in the snoozy, you know, period while we were waiting for World War I to start and for the Russian thing to start. It was, in many ways, something that fed into the rest of the revolutions that happened, both in terms of the way that they affected social movements in um, North America and in Latin America with, as they responded to the Mexican Revolution. And even over the course of the Russian Revolution, you know, why does Trotsky end up in Mexico? He ends up in Mexico because it's like one of the few governments in the world that is willing to take a Bolshevik and house them, you know, like like uh, without giving them up either to the, to the secret police of a bourgeois state or to the secret police of the um, kind of incipient... Uh, Leninist state. Um, so I think that that, that kind of uh, history is, is it's, a, it's, a, it's a tragedy that like, you know, we lose that because the historiography in America is so deeply shaped by, you know, the, these responses that people have to the Russian and the Spanish revolutions, because in many ways, Mexico is the way that you kind of get the third world and the indigenous perspectives. And it also has very important things to say about what Marx has called the divide between town and country, um, or to put it in less highfalutin terms, the difference between industrial socialists and peasant socialists, because the latter not only existed, but were an important major force throughout the 20th century before anywhere else in Mexico. Um, and that also is a story that you can't really understand 
uh, without understanding the ins and outs of the Mexican Civil War. Uh, our that. own IWW and uh, and our own liberal imperialists like Woodrow Wilson were 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 heavily involved in you know. In, oh in, yeah, I mean separate yeah, we, stages of the war. Um, uh, Wilson sending people down into uh, Pueblo. I mean, like and um, and I mean it's pretty much a massacre. It, it that's that's very undercovered um the the border i mean i'm actually surprised uh, how little the border skirmishes are with the the vas and uh texas and new mexico in particular are discussed um, i think i only heard about them because it shows up in some like AP the marine hymn or something yeah mm. You know, like, like it's a very minimal, minimally covered concept. Uh, yeah, and, you know, when I, when I learned about it in AP U.S. history, <laughs> I had no idea what the fuck the stakes were. Yeah. yeah, they, yeah. Like, oh, yeah this random dude named Pancho Villa was like raiding across the border. I'm like, like who is this like, guy? Why? 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 Yeah, like, yeah. What's going on? Is this guy just like a is this guy just like a random criminal? I'm like, no. This is like a whole war is going on. Like, yeah, and it's I mean, one of the great revolutionaries in 20th century history, along with Zapata, his ally. So it's, it's well, very, we have to put know, a pin in the awesome. ally part because the tension between the industrial and the peasant uh, and socialist yes. is manifested in the allegiance and tension between Zapata yeah. and Villa because their That's inability absolutely. to coalesce is kind of why they don't win. Yeah, that is one of is, there, there's there's quite a few explanatory factors there. Um, uh, if you don't mind, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm well is, this, is, is, is it time for me to go into the, yeah. the, set, the, the, the set the stage? Let's talk about Porfirio yeah. Diaz and, and what's going on. Yeah, let's let's talk about. I'm just going to talk about the very broad historical strokes here. What's up, John? Yeah. Michael? Sorry, just one last one last point before I forget because I don't think we'll get back to it before you're okay. in the throes of your summary. Um, besides racism, big problem is language barrier. I do. I do hmm. want to say that, that. That I mean, that's part of the reason why I'm a secondary uh, uh, author on this piece is because I was helping out with the Spanish language sources, which are so rich and have so much of this detail. Uh, because the Mexican historiography is extremely sophisticated, uh, but it's just like it barely makes it into Anglophone accounts. Because unlike, say, French or German, Spanish or even Russian, Spanish is not a language that has like you know outside of the specialized language departments a kind of rich. Uh, connection to the social sciences in the West, uh, the which is sciences. which is embarrassing for us social scientists, you know, exactly. living in a country where, you know, we're we're honestly, I'm going to just go on a limb and say the Americans are better at sociology and anthropology than most than any of the Europeans are, uh, <laughs> and yet we're not really engaging with the fact that Spanish is the second most spoken language in this country. By I was a about lot. to say it, it, the United States is what the second or sometimes I think even the first largest Spanish speaking country because of just the the percentage of Spanish spoken here, both as a first and second language. Yeah. yeah. And and um, yet, yeah, I mean, yet we don't I, really will, engage that much with it. <laughs> like, and yeah. and, and uh, we're, I'm about to engage uh, in some of that embarrassment and cringe because unlike the two of you, I don't speak any fucking Spanish. Uh, so uh, my pronunciations are going to be <laughs> dreadful. Um, and so, um, so just giving the broad outline, mm -hmm. uh, Mexico, a former Spanish colony, independent, had a very tumultuous 19th century, to put it mildly. Uh, and our, oh, our yeah. character, our 19th century character that's really going to be center stage is Porfirio Diaz. Um, Diaz was a veteran of multiple 19th century civil wars, uh, including both for and against legendary Mexican president Benito Juarez, uh, <laughs> and consistently uh, was one of the liberals. Like, that, that is... A consistent thing that I feel like is worth noting, Diaz is consistently a liberal, broadly understood. He is generally fighting against conservatives and reactionaries. Um, and anyway, Mexico had a general principle of one-term presidencies. Uh, and President Lerdo, uh, Benito Juarez's successor, ran for re-election. Diaz leads a coup against him. Uh, and then uh, in a moment of incredible hypocrisy and comedy, rules the country for 35 years. Uh, with some puppets. So there are a couple of puppet presidents in there, but fundamentally, this entire era becomes named after him, the Poforiato. Uh, it is, to, to use an analogy for us Americans, uh, this would be like if Biden ran for a third term and Pete Buttigieg reacted to this by cooing the entire fucking government and then ruling the United States for the next thir thir 35 years. Yes. Like, that is the kind of... that is. And this is not a, a this is not a completely lame analogy. It actually and, goes further than just the surface. And, of and it. almost making mm -hmm. the European puppet emperor look good in doing yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, yeah. to be fair, it's actually kind of hard to hate Maximilian. He's just such a cheerful guy. <laughs> like, so, Maximilian's just such a dope. Like, yeah. it's, it's genuinely kind of hard to actually hate him. Like, yeah, when, when you read about him and his regime. <laughs> Yeah, when you think about like like uh, like Napoleon sending a Habsburg over there, and you're just like, oh, they're just sending him to get butchered, aren't they? <laughs> like that's pretty <laughs> much what happened. But yeah, let's uh, um... like, like, why would you take that? Um, no, he, he he thought that it was a good idea. Like yeah, he's, yeah, he's, 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 he's good, an idiot. Like that's what happened. Like, was just... Put two and two together, you know. No, so uh, just to add a little bit of uh, color uh, as well, the uh, you know the, the Porfiriato is just one of these like obscene sort of like dictatorships where you know liberals liberals make a big deal out of like rules and norms and procedures except when they feel like they don't give a shit about them anymore in which case these just become so many tools by which to just like impose might is right you know upon everyone forever so the porfiriato is like you know like you have a bunch of people who are like inspired by like auguste comte's you know positivist sociology and by like the tradition of republicanism and like you know we're we're a junior republic to the united states which is the senior republic in the hemisphere and we have to oppose the monarchies of europe and all, like all that kind of like rhetoric but then like emperor you know porfirio diaz basically just like you know, appoints governors, you know, as he chooses um, and actually institutes um, a system of local bosses uh, called the caciques. And um, the, these local political bosses are extremely important in Mexican history uh, before the revolution, during the revolution and after the revolution. This system of political bosses will be extremely sticky uh, because basically these were local elites who had enormous amounts of power, whether or not they were uh, appointed to the institutional role of governor or not, because the regime would use them basically as like foreman in the haciendas so in order to make sure that like peasants continued working we're talking about like you know peasants who uh were either landless or were soon rendered landless by the enclosures and privatization mm -hmm. now they would work on the big haciendas uh doing cash crop export agriculture uh and in order to make sure they didn't run away you basically had like a kind of like um a kind of like labor gang system. Uh, and one of the key functions of the caciques was to be basically the foreman of that system and these kind of like local, just sort of like one-stop shop, local petty dictator, like the person who runs like this town or this region or these series of towns. And if you need somebody roughed up, you go to him. If somebody tries to escape from the hacienda, you know, he'll, he'll send the dogs after them. You know, if, if, uh, if, if, if somebody wants to do like a big shipment through it, you might have to like pay a tribute to them. And it, obviously it's all semi-legal quasi mafioso stuff, but the regime not only tolerates it, but encourages it. And in fact, imposes the system where it didn't exist before, because that's the way that the central government is able to control this giant sprawling subcontinent, which is Mexico. I mean, like people don't realize how big and diverse Mexico is. It's not like, an ethno state with like one, you know, dominant ethnic group, you know, even though a lot of like forced, uh, you know, inter intermarriages, you know, that created like the big mestizo population, all a lot of the indigenous cultures uh, survive to this day. Actually, I mean, you're, uh, you're in South Mexico, you'll hear Zapotec. If you're in, uh, if you're in the Yucatan, you hear Quiche, mm -hmm, uh, Mayan. Mm -hmm. and, 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 it's I mean, also uh, what where you can't predict what the X is in Mexican Spanish is because there's it's, so many it's not great. In, in yeah. languages. Um, um, I mean, I, I have a very, uh, a very odd story from my college was uh, one of my fellow students was after graduation going to become a nun. Uh, and I grew up Catholic and I was like, oh, wow, your, your parents must be really proud. And she said, mm, not really, because her father was a Mayan priest. <laughs> so like, <laughs> like, you know, like this stuff is still very alive. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, th thank you, John Michael. Uh, John Michael actually has a, a wonderful image uh, summarizing the Porfiriato, uh, the scientific. Oh, oh yeah. yes, of course, yes. Um, I need to screen share it, um, and I don't know how to do that. Uh, Go to present button at the bottom. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, this is all. This is all just preamble to the actual main event here. This is. Yeah, we I, haven't even gotten to the revolution yet. I mean, the. It, it, the independencia, you know, that's 1810, and uh, mm. there's – if you've ever listened to the Mexican um, 
revolutionary uh, national anthem. There's a lot of talk about blood and fun stuff. It's a very violent national anthem, even compared to the U.S. one. Um, but one of the funny things is when you realize when you look at Mexican history, most of that is civil wars and then invasions from America are France. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, yeah. well, it's uh, you know, as I say, uh, so yeah, yeah. Here, here. <laughs> so these guys are called the Cientificos, and they are Porfirio Diaz's cadres of advisors. Uh, and th these are very important folks. Uh, I mean, it's not important to know their names. These are some of the founders. Those are the most Criollo-looking motherfuckers I've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, like it's literally like the Platonic form. <laughs> Of like the liberal bourgeoisie, it's hysterical. And but but what's interesting is that these aren't like southern planter types at all. Those exist, but that's not these guys. These guys are government bureaucrats who are involved in a technocratic, top-down form of um, state-led industrial development for the purposes of like you know high-speed privatization and kind of like you know. Uh, focusing on basically giving all the land that doesn't already exist under the kind of like authority of the like big planters to them so they can do cash crop exports to Cargill in the USA um, as well as other like, you know, um, big buyers from the industrialized countries in order to basically shore up Mexico's Forex and also increase economic efficiency by of course, like preventing, the ordinary people who are the vast majority, the peasant majority from being able to grow their own food as they have for like hundreds of years and instead forcing them off the land so that they either have to work uh, in the cash crop sector or in industry uh, and you can have economies of scale in cash, cor cr cash crop exports even if there's not enough food to go around to feed Mexicans without imports, which is another problem that happens in this period. So there's all sorts of things that they're that they're doing in this time period that are both like classical like capitalist uh, style development, but then also are just like uniquely stupid and single minded and kind of like um, just not thinking through the consequences of their actions. Because when people don't have a political franchise and they're being immiserated, at, like dramatically so, like to the point in many cases of like starvation or permanent debt peonage to their to their owners. Uh, I don't know, actually, I shouldn't say owners because there is some slavery type stuff in the north, uh, especially towards indigenous people. But it's mostly just uh, wage labor. But like a very very like company town, you're trapped where you are, kind of wage labor, like a quasi serfdom. Um, yeah. So like like the Appalachians in the United States uh, are yes. are the are the post Oki towns in California is basically uh, are, are the indigenous reservations um, because basically they were used this way too. Uh, but it, that's the entirety of the Mexican economy for the most part. And I don't think people realize that. Um, is it yeah, just basically yeah. industrialized agriculture um, and, and priorly like strip mining, but yeah, I, I think uh, that that's important to realize. I, I do want to put a little bit on uh, a point on this, though. One of the, the great ambivalencies about Mexican historiography is Benito Juarez, because Benito Juarez, while he is literally still to this day the only indigenous president of Mexico, um, he started most of this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think that that is uh, part of, um, you know, part of the reason why this is also complicated is that so much of this is liberal on liberal fighting. It's not like a very clear, like revolutionary versus reactionary fight. A lot of the time, like it's, it's, there's like 15 different liberal factions and they tend to be the ones in the driver's seat for a lot of it. Um, and, uh, you know, that was, that's our little interlude on the Poferiata, which we'll go back to, but you know, just going to the actual Mexican revolution, the extraordinarily fast summary of the Mexican revolution is that Diaz, Porfirio Diaz ran for election again. Uh, for was it seventh or eighth? Yeah. I always forget it's something it like that. Seventh or eighth, something obscene. He was in his eighties. Um, and there are rigged elections, by the way. It's yeah, all like rigged elections. So yeah, this is this is tin pot dictator shit. Uh, and uh, finally, one of his opposition candidates snaps and uh, function does in fact successfully overthrow the um, the the Porfirato. Uh, and this is its own stage of the Civil War. There's a whole stage of the Civil War. Uh, I believe the battle that fundamentally lost it for Diaz uh, was being headed by Zapata. Zapata's forces were the were the vanguard uh, in that 
stage of the Civil War. Um, and then Madero is the president of Mexico. Very, very briefly, uh, Madero really just kind of ran on like election rights nonsense and cons constitutional nonsense uh, and not on land reform. And he was dragging his feet about all the land reform stuff that was really driving a lot of the popular unrest. Uh, and then he gets cooed by a guy named Huerta, uh, who's uh, probably the most reactionary shitbag to get reasonable amounts of power during yeah. the during this war, um, who quickly gets overthrown by Carranza, once again with Villa and Zapata helping uh, in the overthrow. Um, but then Carranza uh, successfully defends himself in two more stages of civil war, uh, defeating Villa and uh, Zapata and establishing the PRI, and that's the government of Mexico into the 80s. And that's kind of your whirlwind tour of the Mexican into Revolution. Into the 80s, into the, like, the 1990s with a brief yeah. break with uh, Vicente Fox Calderon coming back and then losing yeah. to AMLO. But yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. I, I was dealing with the pre when I lived there. Um, oh, no, no, the pre, I, I'm pretty sure the pre are still around. They're, they're still around, yeah, yeah. Well, I would just say they were pre? uncontested until the 80s. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. Just, just fully uncontested into the 80s, and then they're contested, and then they're only, like, finally now, like, not the dominant power in Mexico. Yeah, the uh, yeah, contestation I, came mostly at the beginning from the right, but also from a rightist opposition that was kind of approved by them. Mm -hmm. So like the PAN, the party, the party Action Nacional, uh, which people know from Vicente Fox, and they think Vicente Fox is a liberal by American standards, which just proves you they don't understand Mexico at all. Um it, it you know. Uh, was allowed to run, but we're jumping way ahead. So back, yeah. back into the Mexican yeah, Revolution. Ba back into the Mexican Revolution. Yeah, um, yeah. So you know that's the, the and a, as you can tell by the fact that there's what did I list five stages of yeah. civil war. Like this is not a clean civil war. Like, like civil wars are not generally clean, but this is not like the American Civil War or. Uh, even the the Russian Civil War, let alone something like the like the the first Congo War, you know this is this is a war where people are fighting over these very like almost sometimes seeming if you are like really a person who's just like if you're going around saying the Democrats and the Republicans are the same political party, these political differences between you know between Madero and Carranza they're inscrutable. You know, yeah. they're going to be inscrutably small to you. Um, part, of that, part of that is also the way that um, political elites, right, like figures yeah. at, at the head of these factions. Note that all these factions, right, are, are like, you know, somebody's name followed by Ista, right? The Maderista, yeah. the Catsistas, you know, all this stuff. The, the, the people who become the figureheads of these factions would often try to take popular, um, you know, popular revolt that was just happening for what a Marxist would call organic reasons, right? People reacting to their material conditions, the peasantry in uproar, and the small urban industrial working class also in uproar uh, later, you know, and then trying to channel that into a power base for their own personal uh, dictatorship, or as, as, as it's called in Latin America, caudillismo, right? So it's a lot of opportunistic politicians in a kind of vast amorphous center you like, you know, following the collapse of the Porfiriato's establishment, uh, trying to then kind of like take all this popular discontent and channel it into a power base that can elevate them um, to 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 power. And of course, you know, this is magnified by the cacique system that I mentioned before, right? Like, you know, there's local bosses who, when they see the collapse of the central power, uh, see an opportunity to exert, you know, regional control yes. over. So to to. It, to give this to people who maybe know other revolutionary history, but not anything about North American revolutionary history after the American one, kind of, um, is it's very much like the warlords period of the Ori Commandong and the Chinese War. For I was going to bring up that, like, like the the biggest kind of difference between this and the, the, I, I know the, the the warlord period a lot better. China is a much more comfortable area for me. Uh, that like a big difference is mostly just that the factions in the Mexican Civil War managed to seize central control pretty fast. Yeah. Oh yeah. That, you that, know, it's not. It doesn't take like it's not like years and years and years of like amorphous 
lack of control. It's but, but pretty. It's relatively bad. But central control means control of the capital. Yes, which is which is the key thing, right? Is that like yeah. you know. The capital yeah, district federal is all important in Mexico, and the hinterlands are not. So it's yeah. But go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm actually surprised. Actually, there weren't more attempts to set up set up independent succession states within Mexico by these caudillos. Well, it's it is it is one of those things that like like it does happen at a couple points. Like that was actually uh, a thing that Benito Juarez himself did was that uh, he had to retreat to Veracruz for a couple of years uh, while Diaz was chasing him down and he managed to rebuild his power base uh, and then retake the capital. Um, and it's a kind of, and, and yes, yeah, it's, it's the lack of splintering that's kind of interesting. It's the lack of like long fractures. And I think a significant chunk of that is that uh, one of those things, that, like if you, if you just look at the Wikipedia level summary, you will see that Vio and Via, not Via, Via and uh, Zapata, the, their factions are consistently showing up in every stage of the Civil War, usually on the same side as each other. And then they did definitely have disagreements. There's a reason why they don't really just, why we don't really refer to them as the conventionists, even though that's what they tried to do. Uh, yeah. they, they kind of failed at that. But uh, when at the end of the Mexican Civil War, kind of a decisive thing was that the government forces inflicted 50,000 casualties in a single battle on the Via forces. And, you know, it's possible that if that hadn't happened for any, in any of a number of ways, we would have seen more splinter. Yeah. I think people also need to understand, um, they, people know about the, the Mexican American war and the loss of over half of Mexico and that, but, uh, the Yucatan is still disputed territory. Mexico had claimed Columbia, uh, it had claimed Guatemala and other areas in various attempts during during the period from from 1800 to 1910. So people understand the political chaos. There are two empires and three different republics. We're getting into France level, uh, you know, different governments with different borders. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. each time, and the same people who would like. For the United States, for example, during this time period was all over the place. So while there was the Mexican American War during the fight against the the, the play uh, fight against the French and the the weird interregnum of Maximilian um, Habsburg, the uh, the Americans side with Benito Juarez uh, on <laughs> Monroe Doctrine grounds. So like. Everything leading up to this is also super chaotic, which I think is probably why when Prof when Profio Diaz is gone, there really is. It's not hard to take the center because no one's really in control. He was he and Benito Juarez had pretty much held it together for the second half of a century. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I if if I could get in for a sec, I think that the way that we've been talking about the Mexican Revolution up to now. I think is very close to the typical historiography of it uh, that you'll find in like most Anglo-American and kind of like establishment uh, Mexican, like, you know, pre associated type yeah, stuff. I was trying to give the most establishment take. Yeah. That was, yeah, that was intentional. Yeah. 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 Because like, because I think that like that's important to note for folks is that, um, you know, if it were just a matter of like, well, you know, the peasants revolted and then all these strong men were trying to take, uh, you know, to, 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 to leverage them to create their own version of a dictatorship, then it would just be one ruling class replacing another and there wouldn't be much of interest to social movements. However, and this is, I think, what's really interesting, and perhaps it also um, contributes to, the, to an answer to the question, this is me speculating, of why there wasn't more fragmentation, actually, because the Mexican Revolution particularly in its most radical stages, but even from the very beginning, even before the revolution proper gets started, is very much a social revolution and conceived of as such by any of the factions that were what you might call working class factions. Um, the kind of like autonomous people themselves as they rose up, you know, that then the political kind of caudillos were trying to kind of, you know, uh, capture and harness for themselves not always with the most success because these armies retained um, a great deal of their independence, um, the, uh, which, is, which is part of the reason why the war went on for so long. 
And this is where I think the kind of like unique angle of, of our essay comes in because, because part of what we do is that we reconstruct the history from both before the revolution starts and then the early, you know, the, through, through the revolution of how there was always this, um, this current, and, you know, we use the word that Varn doesn't like, libertarian socialist, yeah. but, we use it, but we use it because, like, it, it's, it's not, like, strictly anarchist. Um, it's, it's this kind of, like, worker control socialism uh, that manifests itself as syndicalism in the cities and as uh, agrarian peasant socialism uh, using, uh, collect the, as, as its institution, this, like, non-state collective farm uh model called an ahio which is uh ahio, which is kind of similar to the me well uh whatever the 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 peasant commune is in russia that the the, 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 the mirrors can yeah the yeah, mirror i was gonna say mirror has multiple meanings in russian i was making sure that i wasn't getting confused with the other word no nope, you're right you're right it's mirror uh, yeah but yeah uh but so it's yeah. kind of similar to the mirror um and it also kind of you know based off of a weird I say weird, but it is based off of like an indigenous detente with the church is where a lot of those forms actually came from. Yeah. But, but uh, we're going to talk about we're going to get into the talking about church stuff. Yeah, you cannot yeah. talk about this. It's going to be a, this is going to be a significant factor here. I mean, um, the Spanish Inquisition is important in this, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's very weird uh, how this all ties in. And um, yeah, the, um, you know, kind of the germ of why we wrote this or mm -hmm. I guess really why we felt like we needed to publish this because this was actually for a long time, just a bunch of research notes for a different paper uh, that then we kind of realized had its own independent story embedded in it. Uh, that uh, there are organ there, there's multiple types of socialist organization mm -hmm. participating in this war. Um, and one of them uh, I think resembles more closely most contemporary American socialist movements and European socialist movements. Um, and it's not the Zapatistas. Yep. It's not the Vists. In fact, uh, it's the people who betray the Zapatistas at a decisive moment that probably threw the whole war in favor of the right-winger factions. Yeah. And um, so, you know, to, to go into that, because again, like none, this is not one of the factions that gets like a, a, a leader name is it like there's like 20 different factions that all get named after leaders in this and you know we've talked about a couple of them the Carances, the the zapatistas uh the maderists the pofriata um i apologize to both of you for making such a mangle of a beautiful language yes, is muy gringo. <laughs> uh, hi Pero Indian, oh, uh, Indian uh, but uh yeah the um but yes, the, 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 we're talking about the uh, Casa del Obrero Mundial, the House of the World Worker, which, uh, to my knowledge, doesn't actually have any direct connection with the IWW. Uh, but we, Sorry to cut you off, but can we, before we do the CDO, can we actually do some of the pre-revolutionary stuff? Oh, like sure, sure. Why not? Why not? Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, let's backtrack a little bit here. Why not? Super well, I, complicated. I just, <laughs> no, Maybe this I, is also why people don't understand it is because, like, there's it's very hard to get even to like who all is operational in this okay go ahead uh, well i just John want to talk about the plm because i feel like that's actually one of the things that makes this more simple in a in a way that's that's part of the reason why i insist on it is the yes there was like 20 different factions however and this is actually where like i kind of like put my little marxist hat on if you look at them relative to their relationship to the means of production a lot becomes clarified and some and those factions suddenly become grouped into bundles, right? That 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 make a lot more sense in terms of predicting how they're going to behave towards one another. So you have basically under this dictatorship, right? You have um, your classical bourgeoisie, you know, plus like a kind of technocratic apparatus in the state of these, like you know, um, sort of uh, advisors. Uh, uh, implementing their their galaxy brain policies that impoverish the country and make the revolution nigh inevitable, uh, which a lot of like you know dissident social theorists have been pointing out for decades, and you know eventually it just the 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 succession crisis after Diaz dies is kind of what lights the 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 the, the match. Um, the uh, but but then there's like this this general broad movement 
uh, rooted in very, very deep uh, kind of like Mexican political economy and cultural factors, but then also importing ideas from Europe and the United States that creates a consistent left. And that left in the Civil War fractures into all sorts of different factions, but you can see consistently that it's all coming from the same kind of place. So what am I talking about here? Well, before there's any isms involved, you have indigenous people and campesinos. And that's actually like a big overlap group because Mexico, like other countries in Central and South America, like Ecuador and Bolivia, somebody being more indigenous and somebody being a peasant are actually like highly correlated. Um, so that's an important um, sort of uh, dynamic to kind of keep in mind here. So obviously between the Spanish conquest and the Republic and then the French and all this other stuff, you have all these European um, or part European people who are kind of ruling Mexico from the cities. But the countryside, which is more indigenous, has always been autonomous to the extent that people have their little plot of land called the milpa that they can live off of as subsistence farmers while selling their surplus to the cities for pesos that they use to buy uh, industrial goods uh, that they don't make themselves. So that's kind of like the political economy of it. What this means is that like every couple of years, like basically, I don't know if it's like once a decade or once every two decades, but at a ridiculous rate, you will just suddenly have these giant peasant uprisings, um, you know, led by indigenous people, um, oftentimes unified through like kind of like religious imagery, like you know the the it's a it's a common thing to have La Virgen de Guadalupe as a as a uh, you know a, a syncretist religious uh, war banner, um, you know like like showing up and because you know these these people are so autonomous you can't like starve them out because they have their own land and they know how to work the land and just retreat to the mountains guerrilla style like Mao, you, you know they can just surround and circle the cities and and take over the government and. This almost happened several times. I mean, in Mexico's independence war, there's this guy called Miguel Hidalgo, who's like a quintessential uh, uh, lead, uh, figure uh, in terms of leading movements like this. He's like a, a dissident, enlightenment, uh, free love, Freemason type Catholic priest who's defrocked, but then becomes a... Um, a leader of like the, the, the these peasant armies but versions of this happened throughout all the different stages of the kind of like night mexican 19th century and also the uh, i think a couple times is uprising the porfiriato then in the 19th century in addition to this tradition and by the way these people are egalitarians in their political structures villages will very often have large communal plots uh that people can um you know, kind of collectively tend to that, and it, that kind of evolves into the ahilo system. But then there's also just like practices of direct democracy on the village or regional level uh, that are very well developed. And all of this goes back to like previous, like you know, Nahuatl or Tohalabal or whatever kind of culture uh, that existed, especially from the people who were at the periphery of the old Aztec empire. So not the empire itself, but people who like resisted the empire from like outside city states. Yeah, I was about to, about to say these are the same people actually who unfortunately sided with the Spanish in overthrowing the Mexica or the Aztecs uh, mm -hmm. because the Aztecs themselves, uh, this is not readily understood uh, even in a lot of like La Raza stuff today. Especially uh, La Raza stuff. Yeah. Today. yeah. <laughs> uh, th they were settler colonialists themselves from, from what would we now call like Utah, Arizona, etc. Like the, the, according to their own records, they were not, uh, they were outsiders that invaded uh, northern Mexico. And I think this is important because a lot of people have this myth of like, oh, it was the Spanish guns. One, the Spanish guns were shit. Uh, uh, two, there's no way even 250, 300 conquistadors could have taken out the, the Mexica Empire without massive indigenous support. And they had it. Uh, they, yeah. uh, um, and it wasn't from stuff like, oh, they thought uh, Cortez was a god. No, it was they were they thought they were using an outside power to overthrow another uh, empire that had come it, in on their, if, uh, you know, on their if, turf. If you'll permit a strained chemistry metaphor here, mm -hmm. sometimes what you need for a reaction to finish is just a small drop of foreign material for the crystals to all latch onto. Mm. Uh, and that's that. That is how I tend to view what Cortez did. Is that the one of those things that I think is often missed because of the the tendency of uh, Eurocentric histories to portray native societies as 
eternal and forever existing and ahistoric is that the the Mexico Empire was really in a lot of ways more similar to the UN than to a traditional empire yeah. and was like less than a hundred years old. Yeah. It was it was very recent uh mm-hmm. at the time that that it was not like it did not have like deep roots of stability. It did not have deep roots of tradition. It was not popular with its neighbors. Uh, I mean, for obvious reasons. For obvious reasons. And it had several <laughs> internal instabilities that had never actually been worked out. Right. I mean, yeah. yeah it's it's a, like, for example, Teotihuacan, which is where Mexicans, District Federal in Mexico, but yeah. uh, Mexico City now is, is located in. Uh, was a very new and I mean amazing actually yeah. architectural feat. I mean they built an island, but yeah. the um, but Teotihuacan they just kind of took over, like they didn't build much of it, and and it's also kind of hard to know their history because why they did have a written history, uh, from my readings of recent stuff in Spanish, and I have read a lot more about this in Spanish than in English, um. The Mexica themselves had destroyed their own records uh, a generation before Montezuma. The 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 reason why this is all important, though, to the Mexican Revolution is basically like the Catholic Church came in and like had figured out that these like relatively stable like peasant economies with direct bureaucracy could kind of be run like like medieval serfs, and you just had to like, well, join the church and we'll leave you the hell alone, and we'll even like let you keep your traditions. I mean, Mexican yeah, Catholicism is way more syncretic than I think people realize. Oh, yes. And, and yeah. that's, I mean, and that's, you know, people often fail to notice that that's actually often how the medieval Catholic Church ran things. Yes. Was like, yes. Yeah, I mean, like... We it, care about, like, five things. And if you do th- anything else, you do is fine. Yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, like, kind of, it's kind of Hinduism of Southern Europe. I mean, like, people don't, yeah. people don't like to think of it that way, but it's uh, this notion of, like, the, you know, the, the, the magisterium having a list of, you know, a very long list of constitutional beliefs you have to subscribe to is kind of a post-Protestant Reformation situation where in the Counter-Reformation they're trying to solidify things. But, but hold up, I just want to get back to the... Um, to the, this kind of like roots of the far left in Mexico. Yeah, let's go back. One, is these, one of them is this like longstanding indigenous tradition of the campesino peasants continuing sub rosa within the Mexican state in these kind of like autonomous peasant villages that are just kind of able to do their own thing because as long as they pay their taxes and become Catholic or syncretic Catholic, uh, people are mostly leave them alone. Um, you know, and with the exception of what happens when the Porfiriato starts doing the enclosures, et cetera, et cetera. But like, you know, like the 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 they continue then these long-standing traditions of communal land tenure on the one hand and direct democracy and self-governance on the one on the other hand, right? So this is a clear kind of like proto uh left-wing constituency uh that 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 that's brewing here materially. Then There's the actual import after the French Revolution of, um, you know, revolutionary ideas. And obviously liberalism comes along, but so too does socialism. Not in its Marxian form, which doesn't exist yet, but in its Proudhonist form. And it is, in fact, um, uh, anarchists from Europe, including this one Greek guy whose name I forget, uh, Rodolski or something like that, um, who... um, who actually bring over the first kind of like socialist ideas from France um, into uh, the cities. And then out of that, you get the first uh, socialist groups. And while they initiate in the cities, there is a period where before the revolution, under the Porfiriato, those socialist ideas start to mix explicitly with the kind of indigenous Mexican traditions of direct democracy and communal land tenure into a very distinctly Mexican um, anti-authoritarian, anti-state socialism rooted in direct democratic institutions like the rural Ejido and later the, uh, the urban trade union. And this synthesis takes place within a uh, an underground political party that is very misleadingly named. It's called El Partido Liberal Mexicano, the Mexican Liberal Party, and it is yep. not liberal. <laughs> it is like it is a radical left wing and eventually like like explicitly anarcho communist, um, you know, socialist party. Uh, the uh, and it's it's uh, it's it has a bunch of figures who are involved. Um, 
you know, and uh, I should actually. Mexico, a like the United States, is where all political traditions actually call themselves liberal, even though they're sometimes dramatically opposed. Um, well, except yeah. for the, well, I should say that, except for the super conservatives who wanted to reinstall the Habsburgs, which we're going to skip. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and at any rate, they become irrelevant, right? Like, you know. Well, but, well, so there's there's these, like, really great figures, and people should look them up. Um, you know, people like, uh, you know, uh, Praxedio Guerrero and uh, the feminist journalist Andrea Villarreal. Um, she's really cool. There's this guy called Anselmo Figueroa, who is a newspaper, a big newspaper editor. Uh, Antonio Diaz Sotoyama, who's a big syndicalist and later revolutionary. But the ones that everyone remembers and that you'll still hear talked about, um, sometimes mostly in Mexico, sometimes internationally, is the three. Uh, Flores Magón brothers, Enrique Flores Magón, Jesús Flores Magón, and then the third one, especially because he was the the most prolific writer of them, Ricardo Flores Magón. So these these brothers are the theoreticians of this party, and it's a very egalitarian party because they're basically like anarchist socialists. So they're doing the direct democracy thing in their internal procedures. But these folks are the, uh, the, the, the people who organize like, you know, the, the theoretical journal, which is called uh, Re Regeneración and often publishes in exile in Los Angeles. They're buddies with Emma Goldman and with uh, Big Bill Haywood and with like the IWW because that's their political allies in the United States where they're living in exile, sneaking back into Mexico to engage in guerrilla operations against the dictatorship up to and including uh, organizing wildcat strikes bombings, train robberies, um, and also um, the, uh, the, the, the attempt to kind of organize resistance cells within Mexico to the dictatorship uh, that will implement the PLM's program. Now, the reason why all this is so important is that like these disparate influences, on the one hand, anarchist socialism from Europe, and on the other hand, local indigenous traditions merge in the PLM. And this merger is extremely important. It influences all the left-wing factions of the Mexican Revolution. And you can trace a direct line. And it's often not done in the American historiography, the U.S. American historiography. You only really see this line really traced out um, in, in specialist studies or in the Mexican uh, context. But Magonismo, as the, uh, the, 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 the party line of the PLM kind of begins to be called in the late Porfiriato, um, develops this program whose minimum program is just like the socialists in the USA for the eight-hour workday and for an end to child labor, an end to slavery in the North, you know, better conditions for the peasants, whatever. But in the end, uh, oh, and of course, land reform, breaking up the biggest states and giving each peasant family their own land. Um, but in the long run, what they want to do is to consolidate those individual plots voluntarily into ejidos while having syndicalist trade unions run industry in the cities. So you end up with a worker self-managed republic of assemblies. There's no longer racial distinctions and privileges between the more kind of um, criollo and mestizo people and the indigenous people. It would be a multicultural uh, uh democratic socialist industrial republic without a state um right the, now, uh, yeah so i mean what i think is interesting because they do get taken up by la raza thinkers later and la raza the cosmic la raza stuff is also from this time period yes um which was kind of way out of the casta system or what we may call the mexican race chart um and the mexican race chart is unbelievably complicated. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, but the, the, the thing that's easier, the, the things that's easy to see is like, it's not just whether or not you are white skinned or not. It is also whether or not you are born on the peninsula or in, uh, um, like, for example, the peninsulares versus the criollos. Then there's the criollos versus the mestizos. And then everybody versus the indigenous. And also other kinds of mestizos, because according to the casta system, there's like five or six different kinds of mestizo people, depending on how you got all mixed up. Um, and, and I mean, even within that, there are, you know, higher and lower prestige indigenous groups. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know. Yeah. Um, and and uh, so the, that background of this and this attempt to overcome that's like a like it's a perpetual tension in Mexico from like 1850 forward where this is trying to be dealt with. And, and the Magonistas, I think, probably take this the furthest. Um, 
I feel weird calling them Magonista or, Mag uh, or Magonismo, though, because they didn't like that word. Um, no, they didn't. They didn't. <laughs> they didn't um, there's a famous play or novel or something. I forget what it was. It was a play. Where, it's a play, yeah. Uh, where, victim um, and something else. Yeah. yeah. Where, where Ricardo writes it and he has a character say, I'm not a Magonist. I'm an anarchist. And an anarchist has no idols, which is, you know, very, very flag yeah, yeah. and nice. But, but I will say, Lauren, the interesting thing about this whole like Raza Cosmica thing, which is another guy who who comes slightly later, it's, it's kind of like when the um, the counter revolution is consolidating itself into an official state ideology under the early PRI. Uh, his name is uh, Jose Vasconcelos. He comes up with this this book called La Raza Cosmica, which basically says, well, the Mexicans have mixed up all the races. They've got the red people, the white people, and the black people. They've got all the racial characteristics of each of these because this is all like race realist. Uh, and that actually makes them better for the mix because they're like the, 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 the ones who can unify the whole world in a kind of perfect mestizaje. And um, yeah, it's, this it, it, this it, it is social reality. Darwinism, but, but pro mis miscegenation. So. Yes, and it becomes official state ideology, actually. It becomes part of, a, of the basis for a kind of soft eugenics program of encouraging um, uh, uh, racial mixture, which is actually the common Latin American uh, response to uh, racial uh, racial difference in the population. Brazil has something like this as well. Uh, but what's interesting is, and here I might be a bit controversial if there were any of these people hanging about, later in the in the USA, in the 1960s, you got these Marxist-Leninist identitarian movements, you know, because they're all Maoist third worldists, and so, you know, they pick an ethnic group and they create a Marxist-Leninist political party just for that ethnic group, and then they use Leninist uh, nationalism of the oppressed theory to say that you can build the rainbow coalition and all this other kind of stuff. The Chicanos... That's an identity that's kind of spurred forth by this Marxist-Leninist kind of 1960s moment. It precedes it a little bit, but like you know, Mexicans in the USA would often call themselves Chicanos if they were politically uh, motivated. But for the most part, it's like you know this the product of this Marxist-Leninist moment in the 60s, uh, influenced by Maoist third worldism. But their whole theory of what Chicano identity is is actually very deeply anti-indigenous. It's actually the official Priista authoritarian Mexican state ideology that was often used as an excuse to suppress indigenous cultures. And this is very ugly because what is a minority culture within the United States, which is, you know, the Mexican minority from after the conquest of California and such, um, becomes in Mexico itself the majority. And it's kind of a revanchist movement to reunify that with Mexico, but then be following the official racial ideology of the Mexican state, which is kind of anti, not not kind of, very anti-indigenous, uh, especially under the PRI. So that's that's uh, a very ugly thing. You know, people influenced by like Chicano politics don't want to hear about this because, you know, it's... Um, it's 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 become an important part of their identity as like you know Mexican American people in in L A or whatever. But the 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 that's how it shakes out in Mexico proper. And I think that the Flores Magones are to be contrasted with this mm -hmm. kind of enforced mestizaje because the Flores Magón brothers, their father was Zapotec, and they in their battles, their real guerrilla battles against the Porfiriato, which happened before the Civil War. So before there's a Civil War, these guys were launching military attacks against the dictatorship. And they actually negotiated alliances with some of the free tribes in the north of Mexico that still had political autonomy from the Mexican state as military allies against the central government. So, which you can't, I mean, in the context of like early 20th century Mexico, you can't do that unless you build up like multicultural bonds, you know, across ethnic divisions. It's not something that's done through, you know, trying to have this like common mestizo identity. It doesn't work that way in that right. context. Right. And, and and the the tension between the between different indigenous groups and the indigenous groups and other settlers. I mean, that was a whole pretext for the 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 Mexican American War ultimately and the independence of the splitting of Tejas Coahuila into Tejas and our Texas um and you know, I, I think this is really kind of like the complexity of indigenous uh, politics in Mexico, I think is lost on Anglo North Americans that you, maybe not quite as much as on Canadians, but because of the, the devastation of um, settler colonialism on East coast, on the East coast indigenous. And frankly, because uh Northern indigenous tribes had less resistance to smallpox. 
um, and, and we know this now from genetic studies, um, there was not the possibility for that to happen in like the United States in the same way. Like the, the tribes were, were decimated, but, but it is interesting when you're talking about here, because like, for example, the tensions with the Sioux in, in, in Mexican territory, uh, because they were, they were recognized semi autonomous, um, were, were always big. And so someone may doing outreach to them, um, has to speak, be able to communicate with them on terms that they would appreciate. Um, otherwise, you just might get killed. So uh, it's, and again, I, like we keep, I, I think I when I go for analogies to this, I can't even really go to other revolutions in the Americas, like not even like say the great Bolivarian super revolution in, in South America. Uh, or I, I often, the only thing I have to compare it to is China. Um, in the early 20th century, like I, I don't really know how else what I what, and and even that that comparison is not really that good. Um, mm. which is why we keep on every time we mention something, we have to go back in time and talk about why this mur like, uh, <laughs> so so we're at the uh, with the with the PLM, um, the PLM, no, the PL, yeah, the PLM, yeah, the PLM. Um, and I'm just gonna drop a, a book for you guys if you want a decent book in English, there aren't many on this. Um, but the return of Comrade uh, Ricardo Flores Magon uh, by Claudi uh, Claudio Lominitz, I believe, is actually pretty good. That's where I first learned about a lot of this in 2014, 2015. Yeah, uh, Intellectual Precursors of the Mexican Revolution by James Cockcroft is also pretty good. And there's a good uh, AK Press reader of Ricardo Flores Magon's theory called Dreams of Freedom. Um, that is also good. Um, the but I, I, just to finish up this whole side note, and then I'll like Kyle get back to the uh, to the revolution proper. But the reason why the PLM is important is because they do that synthesis. Now they're not actually an active faction past the very earliest stages of the Mexican Revolution. They kind of try to do a revolution in the Yucatan, but then they get crushed. But then the revolution's popping off everywhere, so it doesn't really matter. But the Generación had a huge impact everywhere. Their 10-point program, I don't know if it was actually 10 points, but, you know, like their basic program was the program of the left, all the left-wing factions in the Mexican Revolution. The plan of Ayala that Zapata puts forward, that's that's basically just the recapitulation of the Magonista, um, you know, sort of uh, 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 platform. Uh, it, 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 it consolidates this kind of, like, libertarian socialist vision for what the outcome of the war should be, i.e. the peasants collectively and democratically rule the land and the workers collectively and democratically rule the cities. Um, and, uh, and it gives a common language for this that helps unify peasant revolts that happen across the entire country. Um, so, so yeah, that's the, uh, the, the, that's how you get to then the Zapatistas and the Villistas, the Eastas? How do you say that? Yeah, Pancho Villa. Yeah. I think it's the Eastas. Uh, I think. Yeah. The uh, that's how you get them having basically the substantially the same program. So, sorry. Uh, Although, I mean, I mean, interestingly, the the uh, the Villistas are also Norteño National Liberationist. That's true too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so like, um, uh, which is uh, which is one of the problems. So, so okay, th that. I think we have the ideological background. We have the background of the Perfidiado. Now an hour in, let's begin our summary of the actual revolution. Well, I mean, to be honest, what, 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 I would be less a, you've already gotten the 30 second summary of the revolution. The question here is less what happened and what happened that made me and John Michael want to zero in mm -hmm. and wanted to want to write about this. And it's an organization called the CDO. Uh, I mentioned it briefly earlier, uh, the Casa del Obrero Mundial in my horrifyingly gringo ass pronunciation, the, the House of the World Worker. Again, as far as I know, not related to the IWW other than the name being similar. Uh, and so the CD, so the thing is like, again, us as 21st century educated leftists, we look at Mexico and we want to be the Zapatistas. In no small part, because there are current neo-Zapatistas 
uh, that you know have an indirect connection to the original Zapatista movement. But you know they're they're heroic, they're flashy, they seem very cool, they make great photo opportunities, they write cool articles. We want to be like them. And looking backwards on the Mexican Revolution as it happened, it feels kind of unambiguous that the Zapatistas were in the right. Uh, but in terms of the actual classes involved, in terms of the cultural beliefs of its membership, we're not actually that. None of almost none of the groups that you see in the anglophone in the anglosphere, very few of them have anything similar to the Zapatistas. There are some. I, I will say that, for example, the IAF. They, if they want to claim, if the IAF want to claim that they're similar to the Zapatistas, I, I'll, I'm not going to fight them on it. But um, if you want to claim that, you know, the DSA or the ISO or whatever are drawing on the memory and legacy of Zapati of Zapatismo, I'm going to tell you to get the fuck out of here. Like, uh, who, who, most of us contemporary college nerd ass leftists uh, resemble is the CDO who. CDO was more was urban. It was largely working class, uh, but you know, in a country that had what was it? I think a twenty percent literacy rate. The CDO membership bragged over eighty percent. Uh, it was a collection largely of unions. I know the railroad union in particular claimed a one hundred percent literacy rate. Um, you know, these are the people who are putting on plays and putting and putting out tons of newspapers and. You know, the biggest difference between them and any contemporary left wing movement that I can think of is they had a fucking army. Yeah. Uh, you know, they had an actual army. And when push came to shove um, and the Civil War went into the Carranzist era after Huerta had been deposed uh, and disputes between Carranza and Zapatista and uh, Villa had been in an alliance together and then that alliance fell apart over a number of disputes, the CDO sided with Carranza against Zapatista and, uh, and Villa. And they cited, they sent in 12,000 soldiers, which is not trivial. I mean, it's not the largest okay. unit. And I don't think they participated in any major battles. They participated in like countryside suppression coin type operations. Which is in some ways worse, morally speaking, uh, and yeah, uh, that, 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 it means you have leftist paramilitary distrods serving a yeah. centrist government. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Think, think about your food not bombs group being part of a death squad. Like, <laughs> like, like, like the the constitutionalist army, the Gatoncista army, is fifteen thousand, yeah. and the CDO's <laughs> army is twelve thousand. Yeah. So this is like. The, the, this is, in a in a war at this stage with those kinds of numbers, that was a decisive kind of yeah. like contribution. It was, a, it was a it was a very large it was a very large army by all considerations. Yeah, it was it was a non trivial force. Um, I I tend to kind of hem and haw about uh, their direct military con contribution because you know the the war was really decided in one battle that I am really not going to try to pronounce because uh, holy moly. Uh, Oh, it is. Word? It's it's a it's it's got a lot of it's got a lot of consonants. Well, together. I mean, the, I, we also do have to complicate this because we're jumping a friend to to the to the to the the house of the workers of the world. Um, yeah. Uh, we do have to deal with the Pact de Torreon because yes. the left okay. had also sided with the Carranzas before, and it was yes, a different yeah. left. That was the Vias siding with the Carranzas. So, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. No, no, the, yeah, Carranza, you, you know, the, the yeah, the, like I said, the Civil War is really complicated. You know, yeah, the, the Carranza actively had to fall out with Villa and Zapatista. Like, it wasn't like these three groups were all kind of in this natural set of the Carranzist versus the Villas and the Zapatistas. That was that was not what happened. You know, that they were all together in opposing Herta. Uh, it was only after they had they had deposed Huerta that the three of that those three sides fell apart. Um, yep. it's, it's so, so complicated. <laughs> it's yeah, such I a mean, mess. But because, because by the way, when this ends, it doesn't end with Car I mean, Carranza's faction arguably is the one who wins, but it's not Carranza himself. It's somebody he also kind of betrayed at one point, and that's Alvaro o Obragón. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're who, right. Yeah. Who, who I, I totally didn't even mention. Didn't even didn't even mention Obragón. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't even come up. Yeah. Uh, 
yeah, did did not even come up. And um, but anyway, my my whole kind of impetus in this is looking at why did the CDO make this decision to side with the constitutionalist government against land reform, uh, against peasants' rights, against indigenous rights? Why did they make this decision, and what did they get for it? And yeah. because again, I think that on like core political grounds, they actually much more closely resemble any socialist organization that would take me. And I think they made the wrong choice. Yeah. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, one way before Kyle gets into explanations that people might help visualize this, I use this in a footnote in the piece, is um, imagine if the Magnavists and the CNTFAI were in the same country, but the Magnavists were in the countryside and the CNTFAI were in the um, in the cities. And then the cadets are running around, right? So it's as if the NTFAI sided with the cadets as against the Magnavists. So like, if I impose the Spanish Civil War on the Russian Revolution and place it in China. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like, well, this, this metaphor totally does make things clear. Yes. No, absolutely. It, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> I, mean, I, I think it makes it clear to me. I don't know. The, uh... No, no. no. I, I think the, I mean, I'm not saying that it was a virtual thing. I'm just making fun of you. But uh, it, it's, it's, you know, um, but yeah, it, it's, um, it's, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's a very messy situation. And, you know, this is part of the, again, I think this is a non-trivial contributor to why we don't tend to talk about it as much, is that it's not a very easy morality play. No, it's not. You, you know, like in the case of the Russian Revolution, you have reactionaries and you have revolutionaries, and then there's a liberal faction and a conservative faction that both try to stop the revolutionaries and they both fail. And that looks fairly simple. Or in the case of the Spanish Civil War, you have a reactionary faction and a revolutionary faction, and the reactionary faction wins for reasons that would take us 10 more episodes to talk about. And I think we would just end up stabbing each other somehow because that's how leftism works. Uh, no, is that you get into a, a knife fight each other. Civil War. Yeah, specifically, you, you get into a knife fight specifically about the Spanish Civil War. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's specifically, that specifically the black hole for leftists. Uh, but uh, in the case of the, the Mexican Revolution, it's the, the, the closest thing there is to the, the Romanovs in this is a liberal. Mm -hmm. You know, is a technocratic liberal, and then that gets displaced by like more democratic liberals. And there's revolutionary factions, but they don't really win against these like varying types of liberals. One of Diaz's nephews gets engaged in the civil war, but like again, not even as like a reactionary. Like, how many revolutions have there been? How many civil wars have there been where? A literal nephew of the dictator enters it with his own private army. And is not a reactionary. Yeah, no. like, <laughs> like that's yeah, like, like, like wild. this makes a hash of like, like trying to tell a simple morality play just because it's like all like, like God, like imagine if we had a civil war where like there was like the Pelosiist faction versus the Bidenist faction versus the Buttigiegist faction. Like, what would you even make of that? <laughs> like, and, uh, and the DSA like, betrays like, the IWW. Yeah, and the DSA betrays the IWW. IWW. That's like the, yeah. <laughs> that is the, that is the core of this. Is the, mug too. Like, like, yeah, like yeah. maybe he could actually gone for the left. But then, <laughs> but then at the decisive moment, the Pelosiists win. Yeah, no, it's, it's fucked up. And it's, um, I think that part of what also should kind of like go th be going through your head is the um, the consequence of the loss at this stage is huge because mm -hmm. that's the end of the war. Like you know the 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 Cajanza faction, which later becomes the Obregón faction, but they're the same faction, the so-called constitutionalists or constitucionalistas. They're these authoritarian developmentalist liberals not terribly dissimilar actually to the porfiriato that they replaced but now needing to kind of posture as being of the revolution slightly so, more democratic as long as you're in their party exactly yeah yeah basically, it, basically it, they have like oh, they, they put in a couple of minor constitutional checks yeah the constitution <laughs> become the rep the party 
the institutional party of the revolution. This insane title that's kind of like, you know, multiple personality disorder trying to like both be revolutionary and institutional because they provide stability, but they're also of the revolution. And there are neoliberalizers in the socialist international too. So well, yeah. They were everything. They were, they were, it was it, because they were the only real party in power. So they had left and right wing factions. And in the thirties, the left was in power. And in the, in the eighties, the right was in power. So that's kind of how, how it worked throughout the whole 20th century. These folks ruled Mexico from the end of the civil war in the twenties through the 1990s. Like yep. they ruled Mexico throughout the entire 20th century. So when we're talking about the, the magnitude of the loss that Kyle is describing, we're talking about a situation where the left-wing factions basically through this betrayal, the CDO basically consigned Mexico or helped consign Mexico at the very least to a hundred years of one party rule by a developmentalist dictatorship. So that tells you something about the stakes of a situation like this. Um, and also about the potential power of a syndicalist union, right? Like an anarcho syndicalist union, not a Leninist party or whatever, to actually be a kind of like kingmaker in in a in a civil war situation, which which is both like encouraging on a certain level because it's like, oh wow, like that's a surprising amount of power that you can get through those structures. And then of course it's horribly discouraging in another sense because, well, what do they do with it? And yeah, the answer is Again, it, just to, to, to put this into – this is only one faction. The left factions are all over the place. I mean we haven't talked mm -hmm. – I, I was – when I read your, your thing, I'm like, okay, we're just focusing on the CDO. I don't have to go into like the weird betrayals of the Vist and the, and the, and, and the Zapatist at the end because yep. – um, and that's largely related to Via's attempt to um, – to found a republic of the uh, uh, a republic of the north, um, yep. which he w also wishes to recapture parts of Texas and parts of California for, um, uh, partly because I I do think the VSTs are uncomfortable with the kind of peasant ideology of the Zapatistas. Um, yes. Right, and and it's it's a, a small thing, but it, it feels it feels like the sort of thing that when you look at it historically it feels almost ridiculous and trivial but it does really matter that like they are representing very disparate geographic regions mm -hmm. you know zapatista is really representing the very deep south and via is representing the northwest and these areas aren't you know they don't have super deep connections historically geographically logistically um you know they're coordinating in some kind of complicated ways and Via, you know, to say the least, he had some kind of powerful personal ambitions uh, on top of his revolutionary ambitions. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the, we, the, the North... Uh, this Thank is you for correcting me, because I can I tell can, that I'm not... Yeah. No, this is not a place where I can actually explain it by a, an analogy to another place. Mm -hmm. um, the North's economy has always been largely somewhat tied into the United States. It has been a ranching economy. It's an industrial economy because, frankly, the soil's too shit to run agricultural yeah. peasantry. Uh, mm -hmm. in, it's in it's the dry and the soil's bad. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's awful. Desert. I mean, it's desert. Like, it's, yeah. Yeah. it's deserts, yeah. mountains, and, like, shitty prairie, and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, and the best parts of the farmland were lost in the Mexican-American War, and then in the Gatson Purchase. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it makes sense, like, that they would be a much more industrialized area. They're a much mm -hmm. more urbanized area. If you've ever been to North Mexico, like, their cities, and then there's cartel-controlled wastelands, or Mormon-controlled wastelands. I mean, you know, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> but, but, like, that's kind of how the North is. Uh, the South is small settlements everywhere still to this day. Like, I, you know, I, I spent a lot of time visiting Oaxaca and, and the Yucatan, and there's just tons of little cities and villages and stuff that um, indigenous communities are everywhere. Also, the, 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 there were indigenous in the North, and a lot of the Northern indigenous were more independent, but there were less of them. Um, whereas in, like... Like with the Zapotec and the Nawa and and uh, the the Mayans, etc. In the South, the, I mean, 
I mean, it's funny when people are like, oh, the Mayans died out. I'm like, have you been to Guatemala, yeah. the Yucatan? Like, the it's Mayans really, are still... I don't, know, I don't know how somebody could serious could say with a straight face that... Like, well, it's because I, don't, I heard about... I mean, I know, I know why they say it with a straight face, and it's it's historical ignorance, but yes. Yes. Um. So, and the, the Zapatistas come out of that very rural, very, uh, you know... It, um, peasant it may not even be accurate <laughs> to describe some of these people. Um, uh, uh, and if you go down to that part of Mexico today, for example, like if you're if you spend a lot of time in say like Oaxaca outside of Oaxaca City, um, you go out into the villages, you need a translator even if you speak Spanish. Oh yeah, um, because a, a lot of the indigenous still speak indigenous languages, and they can change from village to village. Um. Like they they have not been standardized. Uh, the Kiche Mayans and the Nawa are a little better on that, but like and the Zapotecs, but a lot of these groups, uh, uh, the Mixtecs, etc., they, they don't. The like because of just colonial policy towards them, they haven't had like standardizations of their language and whatnot. Um, and uh, it's been discouraged in school, but you know that it, it's. If you're out in rural Mexico, and I, I'm always ca careful about how I say this because this can this actually portrays a an image of Mexico that isn't accurate, but it is accurate for this area. Uh, you're still dealing with people who are living a lifestyle that are pretty similar to the way they lived it 200 years ago. Um, uh, that has changed, actually, largely, actually, mostly from like NAFTA and tourism and stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I could I could back you up on that because I've lived in a small, not in the south, but in a in a small village in Estado de Mexico, which even though it's so close to the capital, very similar vibes. Um, mostly indigenous, lots of non-Spanish speakers. Um, um, small village of four thousand people, uh, and um, you know the the thing is that it's kind of like superimposed in time, right? Because yeah. time. Political economy doesn't actually move in stages. It's you're you're you can you can have in the same economy in the core and the periphery different eras coexisting alongside each other. So people will, if they have land, engage in subsistence agri agriculture to feed themselves, but also have internet. <laughs> you know, maybe like the yeah, or, the, well, or definitely have a cell phone. Like yeah, absolutely, they, like and, and a car. I, yeah, and a car and. But they might not have electricity or plumbing. That's right. Like, That's right. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, 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 it, you know, and I also, when I was in North Africa, I encountered this as well, where you're like, wait, you have a cell phone, but you don't have a toilet? Okay. I'm not going to ask. Yep. Um, be, but it makes chain. sense because you can, you can buy this almost anywhere. Right. But a toilet requires infrastructure. Right. And God forbid the state invested infrastructure for the public. I mean, building. Uh, and to talk about why this matters, because I think if the Zapatistas have won, I think, that of course, they would have had their own infrastructure. It's one of the things the, the modern Zapatistas that we talk about kind of want to do is, a, is an indigenous form of their own infrastructure. Um, but when you talk about, like, I was, I was in uh, Ekbalam, which is this Mayan... Uh, community that runs one of the many ancient Mayan sites. They they have an agreement with the state to run it, but the state punishes them uh, by like making sure that they have like no resources. And this really mattered one day when I happened to be at Ekbalam because someone fell down a pyramid. Oh. All right, and why does it matter? Well, this was a this was a Mexican citizen um, because we stabilized him and. I say we because I actually did help on this, um, even though I was just a tourist. Um, and then the indigenous took care of him, but they had to keep him covered and not moving for an hour and a half because the nearest hospital was out of any indigenous area. Mm. So even though this is a tourist site with a lot of traffic, if it was beyond what a medic could handle on site, uh, you know, a local Maya medic, you were kind of boned. Yeah. And and so, like, I think, and that is, to me, a legacy of the loss of this war. Yes. Like, because the south of Mexico does not get to develop itself according to its own, uh, mm -hmm. 
concerns. It, it, it's, it's developed according to concerns of the District Federal. And even today, with the massive industrialization of a lot of Mexico, that tends to be focused around the center and north of the country. It is not in Oaxaca, Chiapas, to a lesser degree, it's not in Michoacan. It's not really in, um, in the Yucatan once you get out of the tourist areas, uh, once you get out of, uh, you know, Cancun, Playa del Carmen, and uh, maybe Merida. Um, it, it's, it, it, and, and when you go out and see it, you, you are sort of like, like when you heard about, if you were coming up in the 90s as a leftist, you heard about the Zapatistas, and it kind of like didn't make that to, that much sense to you. You're like, you're like, wait, but like, okay, I get that you don't like the Mexican government, but like, they're not developing your area. Surely they're, I mean, surely they're developing you as, as, as much as they would develop any, you know, area in, in Mexico. I mean, maybe they just don't have the resources and you go out there and you realize, no, yep. like they are actively not developing these areas except yep. to, to do resource, except to do resource extraction or to fight cartels, which is what's going on. Like a weird thing that happened in Michoacan. I contend that if the Zapatistas had had any say in a Mexican government, none of that would have happened um, in the development of South Mexico. Yeah, agreed. So, Kyle, do you want to um, – where should we go next with this? Well, I mean, um, I was actually going to like, like complicate that a little bit by Let's pointing go. out that one of the things that's, that's like, like actually kind of an interesting effect about the Mexican Revolution is that in terms of who got what they wanted in the following sure. decades, yes. uh, the Zapatistas got more of what they wanted than the CDO. Yeah, this yeah. is one of the obscene <laughs> details that we uncovered. So yeah, well. yeah, that was one of those things that we, I thought was like very funny and uh, kind of obscene. Was that land reform happened? Okay, you know, uh, you know, like like that was, and that was the the big impetus driving uh, both Via and. Uh, Zapatista as factions. That was the, the big underlying, in some ways, the underlying social cause of much of the entire Mexican Revolution yeah. uh, was that the, the, the Porfiriata had been continuously, you know, disenfranchising peasants and had been continuously, um, you know, t stealing the common off the goose to st take from that old English nursery rhyme. And the, you know, that was... It, in some ways, that was the biggest change that came out of, you know, like, it wasn't like Profora Diaz was going to live another 50 years. The dude was, the dude was ancient. He only, he died a couple years later of old age. Like, you know, there wasn't like, it wasn't like he was going to still be the, the yeah, no dictator of Mexico. Execute, no one got to execute him, sadly. Nobody got to execute him. Uh, he, you know, he, he died in America. Uh, America, right? Yeah. New York, maybe? Yeah. Uh, but it's not like he was going to make it to the, the 1980s. Like, you know, that that was not, that's that's not a serious thing that's going to happen. It would have been insane if we had had somebody who governed a country for 100 years, but it did not happen. Uh, it, you know, he, this, the and the industrial workers really got the short end of the stick compared to, ultimately compared to the peasants. Um, that, you know, yeah. the... The, the peasants in the aftermath of the Mexican Revolution, you know, they got the land reform that they had, that had really been the crux of the issue. That had really been the crux of the issue. And for the industrial workers, they just continued to get the sharp end of liberalism. Yeah. So, so I mean, one of the things that that points out about the land reform is that it was necessary but highly insufficient. Because what, yeah, what I'm pointing absolutely. out is the later parts of the pre is making sure, okay, you got your land reform, you get nothing else. Yeah. 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 Um, well, it, it, it's when it, it that's again like part of the reason why it's such like a it's such a miserable thing for if you're like a revolutionary socialist to look at because it doesn't look like no simple there's no like simple revolutionary victory where like all of the enemies of the revolution are crushed the, to the extent that anybody anything good came out of this it was a, a negotiation yeah yeah you get land reform you get free you get free public education to ninth grade um yeah. you get very cheap you, universities yeah very cheap universities uh actually i know people don't realize this mexican universities are pretty good uh but oh, yeah they are they are. Yeah. <laughs> is a world-class institution I, I really yeah. i really think so it's up there with like uc berkeley in the u.s like it, it's it's really good eventually yeah. you get the shittiest form of socialized medicine i've ever seen um <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm an American, so I don't know what to say. <laughs> you, have, you have socialized health care. Whether you have the medicine or not is another question. Yeah, okay, yeah. So how they socialize health care is they, they, they train doctors for free, and then they say, you have to go serve at the clinic to make up your hours that we, we paid on training you, but we're not giving you any – we're giving you a building. Yeah. Yeah, okay. It, it, that's it. And uh, so, well, like, that said, I you know, those little clinics can actually be very well stocked, at least nowadays. Like, just ju judging from um, the, the yeah, uh, but then we're worried about the 60s right now. No, yeah, 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 yeah. We're we're I mean, but, but even now, I just gotta like point out I have been in those clinics where you had to bring your own needles and they're terrifying, but oh, they're yeah. not as actually ter interestingly, they're not as terrifying if you're rural, like they um, mm -hmm. they actually are quite good. Uh, at rural healthcare, um, because often they replace nothing, and there's not any other competitor to which to siphon out resources. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, yeah, th they could be kind of decently stocked uh, because people have stocked them communally. Whereas in the cities, particularly in the north, uh, that's right. Yes, I uh, think that's right. the public hospitals are kind of terrifying. Yeah, nightmare. but you can get good doctors there. I mean, and one of the ironies uh, as being in a, a, a United Statesian in Mexico, they call me an American. They make me say the United Statesians. Um, uh, they just call me a gringo, actually. Yeah, and I was totally okay with that. Um, it's accurate. Um, uh, so, so one of the things I'll tell you is, is uh, one of the ironies of NAFTA is you're entitled to that when you work there, if you work there legally. So, like, I've been in one of the state hospitals when I had an emergency because... Um, I had to use uh, workman's comp time off and mm. I had to go to the state hospital. And that's when I was like, oh, my gosh. Um, and um, but uh, it was actually good for me because I got to meet a whole lot of the side of of, um, you know, uh, of Torreon, uh, where I would not have met otherwise, because I'm pretty insulated from that um, as a foreigner, like, you know. Um, you, so I, I say, I say that because like the, the kinds of like rancheros and stuff, we were not really allowed to go in because of probably overstated fears of, uh, cartel violence during the Sinaloa Zeta cartel war. Um, mm. so when I would interact with, uh, with, um, like, you know, everyday Mexicans in quotation marks, um, would be when I went to the public hospital and when I taught at a on a weekend English camp for a ranchero students. And that's like the only time. Um, so, uh, if, I could, if I could just follow up on, on the yeah, let's get back to the actual thing on lamb reforms. So, I think that this is important for people to understand in terms of seeing what the arc of the revolution is, right? Like, the reason there's a revolution in the first place is because of the just sheer scale of unremitting and kind of unaddressed immiseration of the peasantry. I mean, living basically in a, in a state of permanent peonage as a result of the enclosures and the consolidation of land use in the, um, in the, 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 um, in, in the big, Haciendas that do cash crop export. And the the this was a known problem, right? That like honestly, even from a capitalist developmentalist point of view, had solutions, you know, like like land reform by itself, you know, without socialistic institutions like the Ajilo, and certainly not when when um when those aren't hegemonic, is like, you know, a capitalist developmentalist kind of tool in the toolkit. Um, because there's ways in which having a big planter aristocracy like that in the southern United States depresses capitalist development, prevents the development of large scale industry, right? So there's even like technocratic arguments that the Porfiriato's establishment could have used to justify doing anything but this kind of suicidal policy that everyone knew was leading them towards civil war. You know, as late as 1909, you had this book coming out called Los Grandes Problemas Nacionales, The Great National Problems by this left liberal reformer Andres Molina Enriquez. And this is another one of these touchstones for all the revolutionary factions, basically, because it was this very excellent sort of journalistic, sociological book that just kind of laid it out. 
And those those guys in that picture that I showed you, the scientificos, the the, sci the Comtean sociologists, the experts, the economists who know the numbers, you know, they just laughed in this guy's face, even though by doing so they assured the destruction of the system that they were that they were in, and a total a generation's worth of civil war. So after the civil war, the only way that any government it doesn't matter which strongman, I mean, it ends up being Obregón, but it doesn't matter which one it was. The only way that they could have justified their rule was by throwing concessions to what had previously been this ultra-left and narco-communist platform of Tierra y Libertad, land and liberty, right? That's the only way that you can maintain power in Mexico is by throwing some kind of concession in that direction because otherwise the peasantry will be right back up in arms again. And if it's not led by Zapata, it'll be led by somebody else. So. The basic post-revolutionary political consensus is granting concessions to the peasants, not because they're nice people. Many of the personnel are the same, you know, like, but because that's at this point, the peasants have demonstrated that they have the power in numbers and the power in arms and the power and willingness to fight that the only way that any government is going to be able to consolidate itself is by throwing some kind of concessions their way. So for me, this is although the irony here, uh, I, I I do want to point this out. The irony here is in most of the countries that do this, and this is not just unique to Mexico. This is also true in South America. This is true in China. Um, is that the peasantry, as it succeeds, and in so much that it succeeds, doesn't exist anymore? Hmm. Yeah, I mean it's true and it's not. I mean it kind of depends because I think that I mean this is a bigger thing to get into but like you know to this day what percentage of china's total population do you think uh is a small farmer it's uh, much larger than you think and and until actually some g reforms that was all uh dramatically impoverished in the dungest reform something that i hate is not mentioned when we talk about uh dung and like the dsa are in liberal quarters who, where they also like him um because like Dung ended the education of, of peasant women and That's Dung funny. got rid of the um, doc, rural doctors. I mean, like Dung yeah. completely marketized, completely marketized the healthcare system in the rural area. Um, yeah. I, and uh, it led to, and just to, just, just to point out this uh, JMC, because it proved your point, it led to, the stagnation of life expectancy in China for 22 years. Yep. All right. And the reason why it affects the overall stats is because as of right now, 2023, I had to think about the year, uh, it's still 30%. 30% of the fucking population is small farmers, you know, like it, whether or not that's a peasantry, I mean, it depends on how you define it. Some people define it by majority subsistence, but even that becomes tricky because, like, your classical peasant is doing different things in different seasons and can uh, choose different strategies. Right. Um, you know, and that, that, peasants were not sharecroppers in the same way that we think of them now. That's actually a modern immiseration, but right, exactly. And so, like, like you know, and in India, it's more. It's fifty percent. Fifty percent of of India is still small farmers. That's why the farmers movement is one of the biggest, like, you know, working class movements in the country, such that it can bring Modi's government to its knees and get concessions uh, if they're organized, you know. So I think that the peasantry, broadly construed, uh, is still an important constituency for in many countries um, for, for, for socialist movements, and that the socialization of agriculture, when it's been done through agrarian cooperatives, uh, is from an from a purely technical economic point of view highly so highly successful that in the absence of a socialist revolution in the rest of the economy it gets consolidated into the rest of capitalism through demutualization and that's how you end up with credit agricole in France which is a cooperative of small farmers that is also the largest investment bank in in France because in the absence of a socialist revolution in the rest of France um, that sector basically just to survive integrated itself into capitalism. That, that's also true in South Korea. The the uh, you have the you have the Chebals, which are the big conglomerates, but you also have the farmers co-ops who are also like a major uh, like rural bank, I believe. Right. Um, Japan uh, as well. 
Yeah, so it's like, and it almost, almost happened here even, but uh, that's a different the story. Yes, uh, and it would have worked with the populists as well, because based on the case studies in other countries that had very similar economics, the small farmer in America could easily have survived in the 20th century, and we could have retained a food supply almost as big or as big as the one that we have now, just based on... This, the, 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 the statistics of agriculture in other countries, uh, like the ones that I've described, um, you Which know, so is why Stalinism um, plus plus rural co-ops actually tends to be the actual developmental plan of most uh, uh, developing nation capitalist states, not what the IMF suggests. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also and it's also why, um, you know, like. Marxist policy towards the peasantry is one of the great disasters of socialism in the 20th century because, you know, the, the official line was we have to put these people through the developmental process that the original, you know, English peasants were put through in the enclosure movement because otherwise we won't get development in the countryside. And that's just factually untrue. Like you, 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 you could have done it through this system of, you know, uh, uh, interest groups negotiating, you know, an interchange between the towns and the cities that work so for both JMC, sides. JMC, uh, left libertarian Bukharanist. Um, I mean, yeah, Bukharan had the right line in the 20s. Yeah, on the, on, the, on the farming? Absolutely. I mean, like, you know, I'm, I'm further left than him on worker control. I would have been workers' opposition all the way as far as the factories go. But yeah, no, absolutely. In Soviet politics, Bukharan was right in the 20s. And, like, you know, it's just... And you just can tell from the other case studies. You know, it's not... It's, you, you can't answer that question from the Soviet history. You have to answer it based on the different models that were adopted in different countries and, you know, what was analogous to the situation there. Uh, so anyway, I bring this all up just to say that this is a vindication... The, the Mexican Revolution, rewinding back to what I was saying before, is a vindication of the dual power approach, in my opinion. Because when you have power, power is power. You know, even a state that beats you in the Civil War, if you have the power to make life difficult for them, they will have to throw you at least some concessions. Whereas, capitulate to some group that does have power when you don't, uh, in the hopes that they'll throw you scraps, gets you nothing. Because the CDO, which even had power because they controlled the railways and typist unions and a couple of other important... Electrical. Um, That's a very important yeah. one. They controlled the yeah. power grid. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're just idiots because they, they had leverage in the cities and they gave it up for a constitutionalist, later priista government that gave them jack shit. The CDO was dismantled and replaced yeah. with a bogus bosses union under the control of the central party. Like the, 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 the things that the urban workers wanted, whether it was worker control or higher wages or anything, none of that came about. Uh, so, even on kind of social democratic period of the pre and the thirties, um, it was all done through the central government, not through not through any kind of syndicalist uh, or quasi syndicalist, you know, sort of. Uh, so this to me is a very is ends up being a, not just a very, you know um, uh, uh, a verification of like IWW inclinations, but also um, a, a verification of Marx's revisions to his own theory that he never sent. I get mad about this. <laughs> Uh, Because I I did not realize until very late in my life that the Vera Zurich letters were not sent to Vera Zurich, which is why she never showed them to Polkanov or Lenin. Um, Oh, according to the What Is Politics guy, your your friend Daniel, at least according to his video, and I have to double check the footnote there, but he said that actually Polkanov got his hands on it in the 1890s and then suppressed it in order to... That may be true. That may be true, but... Because uh, that the 1890s is when a lot of Marxist notes were actually getting out into Russia and Germany, but they were not commonly distributed. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, like I point this out to people. I'm like, we had like Capitals Volume Two and Three by by 1891, I believe. Um, yeah. Maybe even earlier that, maybe 1881. Yeah. It was 91, um, yeah. uh, but they were not commonly read until the 20th century. I mean, they're not commonly read in the 21st. Well, yeah, 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 actually, and everyone's like flagellant recitation of of the Capital Reading Group. Usually, people only get through Volume One. So, you think uh, they get through Volume One? I, well, <laughs> I, 
most people, most people, uh, most people get to the stuff about the the bolts of yarn versus the jack price of a jacket, and that's about yeah. where stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, so when I lead a capital reading group, we usually get through volume one. I'll give my Discord credit. Uh, the Discord attached to this thing, they've gotten all the way into Capital Volume 3 without me doing anything because I refuse to teach Capital anymore because I don't want people to just take my opinion for it as set. Um, but but generally it was like, hey, Varn, do you want to lead another Capital Volume 1 uh, reading group? I'm like, oh, fuck. Like, okay, well, it's time to get out my notes about Aristotle. Um, so... They should be grateful that it's not me leading the group because I would just I would just start with Marx's letters about the American Civil War. I'm just like, yeah, let's just start with like the weird historic stuff. Like, let's not even get into the theory. Well, I mean, that, that's the thing is the history historic awesome. stuff actually ends up being more important and also yes. shows. It is. <laughs> it's more fun to read, to be honest. Let's screw it. Let's, let's, let's not beat around the bush here. It's just more fun to read. It, it, it and, is and, more fun. <laughs> And it's more right. I mean, the value theory yes. stuff is. Well, I mean, okay. Nah, I, mean, the, I, mean, I, I think the value theory stuff is important, but that's neither here nor there. The, the uh, I, I know this is the great JMC Varn uh, debate about whether or not a, a value theory is useful, um, and uh, how how much should I should I agree or disagree with MMTers? Um, but I'm not an MMTer. So. I know you're not, but you were. <laughs> You I were, was, Jay. I was. I was. Jacques. So that you're not anymore. We all we all go through our periods, and I was an anti MMT or to the point where I was like, maybe we should put them all against the wall. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I'm glad that I was encouraged in in in, in the, under the Varn, under the Varn regime. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but, uh, I mean, I think, I think it's actually interesting what you learn here. And, and I want to, I want to capitalize this. We have it like, there's so much more about the Mexican civil war. In fact, yeah. we're probably going to come back and talk about different factions and stuff of this, because I think Mexican history, my gringo ass is obsessed with it. Um, I plan on dying in gring, uh, dying in Mexico, like a good gringo. Um, this is my goal in life is to end my like life Ambrose in Mexico. Beer. It, it, Ambrose the, the, beer style. This is this is this is the new colonialism, is overcrowding <laughs> the Mexican cemeteries. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, <laughs> they can do whatever, they don't have to keep me in the cemetery. Uh, and I'm not gonna be using their Wi-Fi and fucking up District Federal. I will say that. Um so, well, we have a great essay. We have a great essay about that. If anybody wants a short comic essay about uh oh, that's a good one, yeah. A laptop class in Mexico City and how they're despised. There's a uh, it was in the futon of issue one. It's called uh, Lingua Franca by Addison Winslow. But anyway, yeah, that, 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 was, that was a really good one. Yeah, that's great uh, because as a as a as a former American expatriate in Mexico, I actually will say that the two places I was treated best as an American expatriate are the two places that have the most reason to hate me, and that was <laughs> Mexico and Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Like this is this is like my my advice to people. I'm like, no, people understand that uh, people in the developing world understand that you aren't your government. Um, yeah. um, w whereas in other places, maybe not so much. Um, you know, the the place where I saw some of the most anti-American sentiment was um, parts of South Korea, which I understand uh, uh, mm -hmm. actually, uh, uh, where there weren't. Uh, but that was where there were military bases because who wants to deal with U.S. soldiers? And oh, I thought it was gonna be. I think you're gonna blame the k poppies Oh no, no, no. Okay. Um, that may be a problem now, but when I was there, that wasn't a thing yet. Oh, okay. And yeah. then in Europe, like. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Europeans are famous for their uh, myopia. Yeah, and, and uh, this whole like, and my my interpretation of European anti-Americanism has always been: you're mad we stole your empire. Like, that's what uh, really this is about. You think we're the barbarian rubes who came back and stole your empire. Like, even though mm, we, we mm. freaking worship your culture, we make you all the sophisticated villains in our movies. <laughs> well, I mean, this just, this just goes to, this just goes to you know, what, what happened with the CDO, just to pull it all the way back to, onto topic. Uh, Bootlicking doesn't get you respect. No, yeah. it does not. It does um, not. Uh, and... Um, oh, sorry, well, I will add that the American, the American 
industrial juggernaut is always, in the last analysis, the backstop for Britain's uh, balance of payments ever since they lost Not the Not anymore! Empire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh. Oof. Uh, All oof. right. Uh, <laughs> All right. I, I agree oof. with you until, until some country decided that maybe it wanted to be European Argentina, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah. If you want to be Argentina, you get to be Argentina. I, I look forward to, to England finally winning the World Cup yeah, uh, was, again. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> but, uh, it's a third world country. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, <laughs> so but, uh, so uh, just, this, this chaos on, on uh, crapping on Europe aside, mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, the, the thing you're right is bootlicking doesn't pay off and strategically, and even from like a from such a corrupted theory as game theory, it doesn't make sense. No. Uh, um, no. Because once you've shown that you will be the left moving to the right, where the right can move further right, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you can't go anywhere else, particularly because in this scenario, because you killed them. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's, uh, I mean, you know, to, to invoke a, a ridiculous, but I still think illustrative group, uh, Greenpeace tends to actually get a fair number of things done, and the main reason why they why they ever do get things done is because Sea Shepherd and the Rainforest Action Network are full of complete fucking psychopaths who will actually break into banks overnight, like <laughs> repel through windows and like like blow up computers and stuff. And Sea Shepherd will sink your fucking ships. It's because there are actual fucking psychos out there who are willing to do insane shit, and Greenpeace can be like, you can deal with us. Or you can yeah, do but it. But it's still. I can't what say what will happen. That, that, that kind of, is well kind of the literature. In the social movement sociology yeah. literature, like the Francis Fox Piven stuff, they call it, um, yeah. what do they call it? Um, the, the, it's like, it's like left flank theory or something yeah. like that. Like, 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 you know, you have to have like the mod, the moderates and the extremists and then mm -hmm. the extremists and the moderates have to work well enough together that they coexist, which maximizes the negotiation gains that you get from yep. social movements. Yeah, um, yep. and I mean, well, like, we all we all want to live in the, we, we all want to be the people who just fully overthrow all of our opponents and put them up against the wall and get to do our entire agenda unopposed. But chances are we're not. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. Uh, uh, chances are we're not, and, um, but anyway, I, I kinda, you know, a, a thing that I, I've just, I just keep on thinking about now that I've hijacked uh, I've hijacked the, the conversation for a minute here. I kind of want to talk about why did the CDO make this decision? What were the what was the decision making process that led to them siding with the governments, with the constitutionalists against the revolutionaries? Um, and one of the ones is very painful for us as uh, you know. I, I, I mentioned this up front. You know, you can look at me and John Michael's last names. Uh, we grew up Catholic. And like most most leftists who grew up Catholic, we had a pretty deep new atheist phase. Uh, you know, probably more apologetics for uh, Richard Dawkins than I think anybody should ever have to confess to. Uh, and um, hey, I was fourteen. You know, uh, no, and I can't hold you responsible for that. Uh, yeah, and uh, well, I mean, like you, you, you know, and, and that was a. I mean, it's a very dead. I, I consider it a largely dead movement at this point, but there is still like a, a current among millennial leftists of believing in a apocalyptic fight between religious believers and non-believers. And this was a factor in the CDO that the CDO, you know, would publish stuff, this, the CDO and their allies. It was, this was actually lose, not the CDO, uh, that our purpose is to enlighten and, and enslaved and ignorant people to overthrow the tormentors of mankind, clergy, government, and capital to refuse to serve the ambition of political charlatans, because no man has the right to govern another, to make known all men are equal because they're all ruled by the same natural laws, not by arbitrary ones. This all sounds good and cool, but you know, one of the things that wound up happening inside of that is that uh, the Zapatistas and the Via, they were very Catholic, and unapologetically so, and they would use, you know, uh, Virgin of Guadalupe flags as battle standards, and the CDO just found this fucking creepy. And this got to the point of like completely insane stuff. They there was a there was a broad conspiracy theory in the urban Mexican left about a banker church 
like that the Catholic Church and American banks were actually all like a grand conspiracy trying to hijack the revolution. Like, and, like, like for one thing, you can actually kind of sense the anti-Semitism in there, right? Like, there's a, a like a weird repurposed anti-Semitism in there, uh, masked as anti-clericalism, but also like this led to them just being so incredibly suspicious of their own political allies. Um, and, you know, there's also, so I, I feel like that's a non-trivial factor. And I, I, to me being very cynical, I read this as allowing your aesthetic preferences to override your actual political interests. Yeah. Uh, I, I, we saw this with the, with, with the, uh, the, uh, Khrushchevist Communist Party, um, Brezhnevist Communist Party in Chile too. Like that was yeah. part of their big. Um, I mean, they did join the coalition, but the, the, one of their big holdbacks was the fact that like uh, the the Christian Democrats were more and more like supporting Allende reforms, mm -hmm. um, uh, and so like one of the things that w you know when you talk about when you study like Chile, you talk about the Workers' Dignity Movement, which was very religious. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, well, um, Marxists tend to have a hard time dealing with that. Um, yeah. And yeah. I say this as a person who like, I am, I'm a believer that largely most of these religious questions take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but I, I do think that that was a huge problem and, and we are not, maybe we should do a whole episode about this, uh, not today, mm -hmm. but the, one of the weirdnesses of the Cricero war was when I was in southern Mexico, you found all these like huge cathedrals uh, that mm. were still around that survived the Cathedral War. And in northern Mexico, they were burnt to the ground. Um, and and I was like, wait, but these groups were the more radical groups in the revolution, but they're protecting the justifiably hated Catholic Church in Mexico. And the reason why I say justifiably hated is like the extraction systems the but they were and and i i i didn't know how to reconcile that um and that mm -hmm. was also true with the sapatists the sapatists uh not sapatists the vs were not as you said they were pretty catholic they were less catholic than the sapatists but yeah. they were still very catholic whereas like the constitutionalists were executing priests yeah so yeah. um and and hanging them from lamppost. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. Uh, you know, a, a tradition that, that right wing governments continued well into well into the late 20th century. Um, uh, I think it's still happening in Honduras. Yeah. And, and look, I, I think that um, on the one hand, this is a tricky thing to balance. On the other hand, I'm not actually convinced it's that tricky. And I'll, and I'll say this from the position of authority of both being a kind of like, um, you know, it, deeply anti-religious in my roots and still very deeply anti-clerical atheist, uh, and also gay, you know, which, which, uh, in, in the Christian world's context, you know, means that I kind of have a built in special well, interest. Saying, honestly, it's not just the Christian world. No, 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 no I know. I mean, like, sure, 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 sure. Like, you know, Islamic world as well, but like, you know, it's, the it's one of world. the, like, there's yeah. atheists who are anti it's one, of the big, it's one of the big world religions that doesn't much like uh, queer folks, yeah. is my point. Uh, and yeah. that's what I was raised. It's the biggest one. So. Yeah. It's the biggest one, yeah, by far. Yeah. So I think that, like, the well, on the one hand, this is a tricky thread, ne needle to thread. On the other hand, I'm not actually sure it is. Because I think that a position becomes pretty clear looking at history and looking at the kind of factions that, you know, I, I generally think we're moving in the right direction at any given point in history. Like, you know, religions are not, the, they're not political monoliths, right? Religions are symbolic networks and cultural milieus within which different political factions fight for power, you know, over, the symbolic kind of you know world and then also the over the physical world using the symbolic world as justifications so to a certain extent up to a point religions have what you might call left-wing and right-wing factions and like you know it's kind of like uh to, to a certain extent the the art comes from backing the left-wing factions as against the right-wing factions and that cuts across the religious secular divide or the cross between religions to an extent so like you know if, if it's a matter of like, you know, siding 
with either the the Stalinist commissar or the Sufi dervish, I know that I'm signing with the Sufi dervish. But if it comes with uh, it, if it comes to be a matter of siding with the um, you know, with the with the feminist communist Iranian woman versus the Ayatollahs, I know that I'm siding with the communist feminist Iranian woman. You know, like like, and I know that it's it's not that simple because what what there is is that there's a lag oftentimes between you know the the ability of even the more egalitarian religious factions to accept certain things that are necessary in order to be in a coalition with either other religions or with secular people. Oh, well, and they move around too. I mean, one of the things that we have to do with the populist party is like it was mostly an evangelical movement, um, and and uh, whereas the evangelical clergy was highly reactionary. But like William Jennings Bryant is like the case point of this that most people might know in America. That's right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. He's a reactionary on evolution. Although, yeah. interestingly, if you hear one of his justifications for it that aren't biblical literalism, uh, it, it's also because he's afraid of racism. Mm -hmm. um, because he misunderstands Darwin in, in social Darwinist terms. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, and then Clarence Darrow and, and H.L. Mencken, who are his major opponents, are reactionaries. They're secular mm -hmm. reactionaries, just straight up. I know people try to convince me that H.L. Mencken, like, left it later on and like clarence dollar isn't really that bad but look at no, I, I mean, in the case of Mencken, it's just that he was funny and they, we want to believe that a funny person couldn't be right wing because nobody yeah. who's right wing right now is funny and i mean the other thing is that he published a lot of leftists in the american mercury until it took its hard right turn in the 30s like like you know so even though no, no, the, 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 people like his writing that's what's going on no 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 yeah. I mean, I, but the, i think that 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 second thing is important though because i think yeah, that's that, true. You're that right. a politically ambiguous figure you know, he was pro-capitalist because he engaged in these debates with socialists where he defended capitalism. But as far as like, you know, the rest of it went, you know, he would publish people from all different points of view, which became really ugly in the 30s when fascists were running around. And well, you know, that's kind of where where some of his true colors were revealed. I don't think he I forget if he actually went hard fashion himself. No, he does not. But, the, but, he but, does, the, but but a movement that... his, his his magazine. Yeah, I said to say that there is a quote paleo conservative hard right national conservative group called the Minkin Club, um, uh, which which is not because of his particular views, but because of the views of the Mercury in the 1930s and 40s. And uh, but I, I I put this I I want to throw this out there because I I have I on one hand I complete I agree with you on the knee jerk reaction to say. Um, religious peasants because uh even mal like had a very careful line on dealing with that in a different context but still um uh, and in fact uh you know i i, I know some some Ma some maoists who talk about one of the big things that uh, shining path screwed up on was going on and like uh immediately attacking church figures and then getting themselves killed and then having to like retaliate immediately which caused all kinds of of yeah. of hostility between them and their own constituency um yeah. but at the other hand i'm always left with the what happened with the christians um in the P korean peninsula all right uh korea is has been a religiously divided society and and not even a unified state and then split several ways it's not just split the way that we know uh uh, the Chosan society is now largely in uh, Yanban in China and the Korean uh, Autonomous Prefecture. But um, my point is the Christians sided with the communists until they didn't. Mm, yeah. they, were, they were strong supporters of the communists up until the end of the Civil War and the secularization got intense. They flipped sides um and uh supported the nationalist and largely moved into seoul and korean conservatism is often kind of hard for americans to understand because it's split between buddhist and christian factions um uh, the, simultaneously uh, another example where this is like uh more more complicated and again it's more complicated also because christians are a minority religion even in korea i mean so that's uh, that's that's part of this um but 
but there there's a reason for example like christianity is a recognized religion in china and it's not just uh you know and yes there's a lot of state control over it etc um but it's also because some of them were actually allies of the chinese during the revolution so it's but there's also this tendency to for them to turn reactionary <laughs> um uh either on social issues or whatever and one of the things that i my approach to this is to say like look we need to be absolutely insistent on secular on secular governments absolutely insistent on on rights of secular people like like uh, sexuality rights i don't know that i would ban churches unless they absolutely get involved in politics directly and mm. you know in, in any sort of society like that because I kind of think the problem usually takes care of itself once you take care of other problems. But, um, and I think actually, weirdly, the West shows that. And the other thing I will say, uh, John Michael, is I agree with you that usually religious worlds uh, tend to be multi, have left and right wing factions, and they're, they contain the same contradictions of the society that produced them. Um one of the things I would say about that, though, as they retreat, they get really reactionary um, mm. as a general rule. And if you want an example of that, my example is the same example I brought up on the progressive end of it in the early part of the 20th century is as evangelicals have lost political capital, they have become more unifiedly extremist in one form of politics. Mm. I, I think that that's and I think that's true of honestly. um I, I think that that's honestly true of a lot of things. And, uh, you know, this might actually hit a little bit uncomfortably close to home for us as leftists, that uh, as you lose actual practical power, the response to that is to just drill down harder and harder into your most extreme beliefs. Uh, uh, you think? You don't, <laughs> you, you don't see any uh, new weird left ideologies coming up that, like, Maybe we should start a Saints cult, the Pol Pot. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm I'm still uh, still I'm still uh, bouncing around in my head an idea for a story uh, about uh, some Marxists who believe that uh, Marxism only works if Marx personally is physically alive, and so they get really invested in necromancy. Uh, <laughs> to resurrect Karl Marx. Uh, <laughs> his whole like necromancer vibe in terms of his literary style. You know, there's always like the yeah. social apprentice and the yeah, um, yeah, the, the, the hobgoblin. Mark, that's what uh, I like Spectre about is Marx. haunting Europe. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. no, it's great. You know, a specter is haunting Europe. My own literal personal specter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wanted to put you on the spot a bit about the religion thing, though, because you have an anthropological yeah. background. Um, not That's to true. Say and I, like, you know, don't don't have our own, but like, you know, what what do you think of that whole thing? Um. So you know, my own kind of. So it's it's always kind of. I, I think there's a lot of complexity to this in that. Um, one of the things that always makes it difficult to talk about in a Western context is that. The West has created a kind of, particularly as Americans, we have the separation of church and state idea. And in order for that separation of church and state idea to be at all coherent, we need to come up with a concept of religiosity that is separable from statehood and from stately action. That like we have to, and that that does go all the way back to ancient Greek notions of a profane, you know, the profane sacred divide. Uh, so it's not like it's unprecedented, but it does make it hard to conceptualize certain things that we discuss. And the thing that I like to joke about in um, about when you talk about religion in most contexts is uh, imagine if you were writing a history book, like you were writing a book about contemporary America and you had a completely separate header for internet. that was totally separated from economy and politics and pop culture, just internet. Mm -hmm. Right. That would be very like, like, what the fuck would you even put in there? And I think that that is often how religion operates, that like it, it's often very blurry where it goes. And we've talked about the Mexico, a state that is infamous for the ways in which religion was essential to the operate basic operations of it as a state. Uh, and I think that my own at a personal level, I tend to think that like my main take, if we are thinking about like revolutionary political organizing kind of stuff is it's mostly somebody else's business and 
if somebody's doing bad shit under the guise of religion, that neither uh, makes it worse nor better. Uh, that like. I mean- my anthropological take is I don't understand what the category is outside of Europe and Europe yeah yeah and yeah and bodies, that's but... that's the reason why that's kind of the reason why I went on that tangent is that like the categorization is often incoherent yeah. um, even like like why do we consider Neoplatonism a philosophy and not a religion but we yeah that's very like, weird to me. that's a very weird sense, I mean, why, do we, why do we not yeah, a religious thinker I mean now now we're getting into the Schwepp stuff. But, but, well, and, yeah, and but people, I've been on this point for years. So like, and, and then, like there's a there's a like a consistent thing about considering Confucianism to be a religion, which like yeah. you know, Confucius himself has like a very like agnostic point of view. You know, like it's not like like Confucius well, himself. I mean, Confucius, as he is as he has been aggregated in the aggregation of the of the six thousand years of Confucian classics. Yeah. Created well, I'm I am talking about in you know in in the in a quote that is as best as we can get to him. You yeah, know, in the analects, like, yes. Yeah. yeah in the analects, he does say like, you know, the question of ghosts and spirits and stuff like that. That's not my problem. Yeah. You know, um, like like pay pay your respects to them because like they'll cause problems for you otherwise. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. I am here yeah, to he talk was, about how you make a good government. Well, and that is how to get people in the ritual stuff. That's important. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's, he's there to talk about a lot of things, but fundamentally... The, the, the first Confucian classic actually is actually a, a, di- a divination text. So, like, yeah. Well, and I mean, like, I, I mean, that, that is... Of, hands. There's no, there is no good government without everyone doing filial piety, and filial piety begins with the execution of the rituals, right? So, I mean, well, like... Right, yeah, yeah. But whether or not the rituals are real, I think, is what is, from our mm-hmm. modern religious perspective, Confucian doesn't give a shit about. Yeah. <laughs> well, and... and like, and, and you know, well, and actually, this actually this actually does tie back into like what my kind of my main takeaway from having done this research project was, is that as a historian, I believe that we always have to view people in the past as existing in a state of uncertainty. I think that if you view the past as a like as a purely straightforwardly causal chain, and anybody who didn't see exactly the events unfold as they would have happened was a fool that we just should never have listened to. I think that if you view history like that, you have robbed yourself of the ability to use history as a way of guiding you into the future. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that the case, the thing that I've learned from this, you know, studying the Mexican revolution and the CDS place in it in particular is that there's a certain amount of risk management to choosing who you ally with and you need to be more careful about it than who they worship. You need to be more careful about it then what do people say they're going to do if you give up everything for them? You need to be more careful than the CDO was. The yeah. CDO fell victim to a bunch of busta-ass tricks. Yeah. Uh, like, like, I didn't get into all of them. You know, the, 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 there, was, uh, there was a decades-long project by the Mexican bourgeois to create a, pro, uh, a proletarian bourgeois alignment. Like, that was a, that was a, a conscious political project uh, they involve some actually pretty sophisticated sociology for the era. Uh, and, and it worked like, you know, and we, as, you know, as potential, as political actors, as, as people living in a political society who have a vision of the world that is better than the world that currently exists. It's impossible for us to do anything about this vision. If we don't make alliances, none of us can just Superman our way through it. We need to make alliances, and we need to think carefully about what those alliances are. Yes. Uh, I mean, and, if, if I could illustrate that concretely, because I think that sometimes these discussions get really abstract, but the point that Kyle's making right now is extremely grounded. And this is, I think, the way that I think about it in terms of like why I was excited about the essay when we wrote it. Like, this is not a theoretical question, primarily. Mm-hmm. about the abstract orientation a priori that one ought to have towards, I don't know, religion or towards an ethnic group or whatever. This is like, what are the rules of thumb that get you the goods versus what are not? And you only get the goods when you have real power and you build that power through building institutions and building coalitions. Um, 
And the main obstacle to that is exactly the kind of bad judgment that Kyle is talking about the CDO exhibiting. And, you know, to, to make that really concrete, right, I can name two extremes that were really stupid, right? On the one hand, and this has come up both in DSA and in um, non-DSA groups, like a libertarian socialist group that did masks and, uh, and ventilators and stuff uh, through a mutual aid thing in California. I won't name the group. But in both cases, there were cases where people um, adopting, especially POC people, adopting an attitude of, well, this POC religious group has a big working class following, so we should ally with them, was trying to force, you know, often over the objections of like queer folks in, in their, in their group, the, the, the group to make like a big public alliance with homophobic churches, like, and not just like passively homophobic churches, but like actively participating in like anti-trans panic kind of church, right? Because they're POC led. And it's like, okay, well, that might be the case, but let's find another one that'll be at least neutral on this issue because Otherwise, it's throwing our comrades under the bus, not to mention members of the working class that don't agree with this and aren't down with this. Right. Um, you know, but but instead, there was a view that was like so assimilationist towards, you know, we need to to capture the religious vote, so to speak. It, it wasn't even a voting thing in the anarchist case. But like, you know what I mean? Like 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 that, uh, that 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 we need to 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 do to build that kind of bad coalition. Right. Versus, on the other hand. You have people who are so um, opposed, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like stupid poll types, right? Or uh, post-left types, uh, you know. Uh, Although to, a lot of those end up being religious, but go ahead. <laughs> yes, I know. To, to, but I, to identitarianism, right, of any kind, right? And who are like, you know, the left is soft on Islam. The left is, uh, you know, the, is, is, letting all these like identitarian snowflakes who use authoritarian uh, cultural coercion to do censorship on, you know, on anything that's not what they believe should be the thing. And because they're the sole representative of the group that they identify. And look, all that stuff is true. I mean, there's people who are, who are playing the authoritarian identitarian game. Absolutely. They're widely despised, including by me. I've criticized them in print, but if that's the only politics that you have, so much so that it drives you into the arms of Peter Thiel's fascist political machine, such that you become a useful idiot, allowing the people who want to impose authoritarian right-wing rule for the purposes of, you know, uh, like having an economic corporatism that puts women back in the kitchen and, uh, and the gays back in the closet and the immigrant groups ethnically cleansing them from the country. If that's, you know, if you're, in other words, if you're, so anti-identitarian that you find yourself writing for Compact or for American Affairs or for Palladium or for any of these other people who are in that machine, then you are an idiot. You are a useful idiot of people who, if you don't just convert outright to their fucking far-right politics, will purge you because you are just their tool for legitimating themselves and for getting knowledge that currently only exists on the left, especially about economic stuff. So this is – I'm not saying that they're – we should run interference for Ayatollahs or for, you know, Hotep black nationalists of the reactionary sort who are anti-feminist and authoritarian, you know, and ethno-nationalist, anti-indigenous, whatever. I am not saying that. I'm saying that we have to navigate between the Scylla and the Charybdis, right? Between the rock and the hard place into some kind of thing that lets us create a multiracial coalition for radical democratic reconfiguration of our of our politics. So and our did I just see the... Libertarian socialists make an argument for Marxist centrism between Scylla and Charybdis. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's other versions of it besides just fucking uh, with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, no, I mean, I like the the funny thing is actually you describe two different factions that ultimately can end up having the exact same politics, which is vaguely national Bolshevik. Um, mm. uh, so, Grim. yeah. I mean, like, the, in that sense, there is a weird, almost horseshoe theory. Like, I mean, you could see this in the character of late, of late and old elderly Richard Dawkins. As, as, uh, I've never been yeah. a particular Dawkins lover, but because there's chapters in, in uh, the God Delusion about cosmology that are ludicrous. Nope. Um, uh, but, but nonetheless, uh, I took him as a, 
ironically, I was like, he's, and this was even before his, you know, mid late aughts turn. Uh, I took him more or less as like, he's an Anglican prig, whether he realizes it or not, no matter how yes. much he gives up God, like he's still an Anglican <laughs> shit bag. And like, um, <laughs> And, and lo and behold, yeah. they're inside the with some of the same people. The <laughs> like, like dead ass. So yeah, no, he's totally fucking right about him. Yeah. So, so like a lot of my a lot of my my instincts is like, okay, I've met a lot of like quote new atheists who went over to the Pat Condal side of new atheism, and that's the that's the one that got weirder and weirder. That's where the alt light came from, by the way. I mean, like, if you really like, I, no, most new atheists did not become an America did not become alt rightist. They became Democrats, an annoying one. Yeah, but that's yeah, yeah. true. Uh, yeah, like science brigade, yeah, which doesn't uh, actually like science. <laughs> no, um, but but like, like, so I'm not. I know some people. All like, oh, the new atheists ended up as like you know, alt-rightist. That's actually very rare, but there is, like, a real tendency for that to happen. Um, and weirdly, they often end up endorsing the politics they were ranting about years before. Yeah. So, you, the, I don't, I'm not a believer in a horseshoe theory, except maybe in this. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, so, um, it, it, it it's funny, and I say that because I've you, one thing I've learned from from like being I you know and I've been on multiple uh, not like a young twenty something I mean one of the things I'll say about Zoomers is those motherfuckers tend to change their ideologies like every three minutes because like <laughs> like uh because they're and, young what do you what do you think we were doing I, I was not I, I was steadfast okay. I was a steadfast I reactionary Kyle I don't know what to talk <laughs> like like um. <laughs> I think I've changed uh, like three times like, <laughs> in my like entire life, which is like you know a decent amount, but like you know not. No, I, I actually. <laughs> oh, I, I've maintained like, a couple of core principles. I've maintained like one or two core principles, but other than that, everything else is just completely fucking buck wild. Uh, so <laughs> I've maintained a democratic principle, and that's about it. <laughs> um, Kyle Stockton phase when? <laughs> I, I've had dumber phases. Here, 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 here. <laughs> so. Here's what I have seen mm -hmm. um, recently I have been reading um, a lot of Adolf Reed and uh, trying to parse my rather complex feelings about him because his general descriptions of the way like I uh, liberal identitarian politics works I actually think is true but um, I hit that essay from 2015, which is the, the Caitlyn Jenner, Rachel Dolmazal essay, yeah. um, which he Oof. wrote for Common Dreams, uh, which is, I think, interestingly sympathetic to Rachel Dolenzal in a way that I think actually is not standard because Dolenzal was severely traumatized. And like, I think Reed actually handles that somewhat respectfully, but is very um throw you know the new sexual identity group under the bus um, yeah it's, and, and, and it's weird that it's so dismissive but it, like it's it's because you're right it's very sympathetic to doll is all surprisingly and yet uses that to be dismissive of the life experience of gender queer people which is strange to me because you'd think that what would follow from the first sympathy would be a sympathy towards the latter rather than turning it into the cultural logic of neoliberalism which is basically what he does in that essay right it, and and that's where i can't follow him and um and i have seen a whole lot of uh for lack of a better word abject tailism in all directions um on these issues and to bring it back to the to the lesson of what you guys were talking about um, with with the casa is that you don't win anything from that. Yeah. Nope. Like you don't get shit for that. They don't thank you for throwing your friends under the bus. Like, or they don't thank you for. I guess they weren't your friends, but they don't thank you for for betraying another faction. Like, and you you also don't convince 
super socially conservative people in the working class to trust you either because they smell something fake about you. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas if you're just honest and don't throw people over the, under the bus and you benefit them, a lot of the personally social reactionary people will shut up because they're benefiting too. Like that's that that's the actually the only thing I, you know I think that uh, Adolf Fried says all the time that I think he's right about. But then I'm like, but if you're right about that, then why do you throw anyone under the bus? Yep. Unless you no, don't you're... think you're throwing people under the bus, in which case we saw it. But like this is this is don't betray allies. Like and and I, conversely. Um, I've gotten in trouble for taking a soft stance for people who have not done the full heel turn, uh, but are still like in between this area where you see them get, moving more and more towards certain reaction reviews. The reason why I'm soft to them is actually the same reason. All right, because if because if you reject them before before they've before they've actually made the decision, you are pushing them in the other direction, and they will be your best enemies because they know you like yeah. and the, that's the a tr- hard thing to navigate the tricky thing is how do you prevent them from from making that stupid decision at the end of the day it's their stupid decision to make i mean well i mean you can't prevent them and once they've made it once they've outright made it they've made it like yeah. but I, but i i do think you have to have I do think there has to be an interplay of sympathy, like you said, with the religion versus the not, versus the secular here. Like, yeah, we don't don't fucking support like queer baiting churches, like, like don't. All right. Um, uh, does that mean you don't go and talk to religious people? No. Like, uh, um. You know, I, it's funny you use accommodations. I remember this logic with the new atheists where they like really somehow thought they were fighting a civil rights war. Um, yeah. Uh, back in the in the aughts when you guys were all five or something and I was 20 something. Um, no, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So I was the, fu- the running they, very I'm flattering old. to say that I was, I was very flattering to say I was five. You, you have yeah, a better beard than me. I was an awesome millennial, actually. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure you were already well into your formative. A five yeah, I was, I was able, what does that I was able make me an elder god zennial? I think I'm. I think I'm actually considered a geriatric millennial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is yeah, the, the great term for a young person, geriatric, right? So, so, <laughs> so a geriatric millennial is over what thirty? Jesus Christ! I thought it was. I thought it was over is it? Then I'm a geriatric. Damn, that's depressing. No, yeah. I, I don't know. Okay, over. Anyway, it doesn't matter. These demographic categories are stupid, except for baby. They numbers, are stupid. We all know are evil and actually are a material force in the world. Um, I'm, I'm with only, you, Varn. I'm with you. I'm only, only kind only of kidding. I do think they're a material force in the world. Uh, I don't think they're all evil. Um, but uh, the. the uh, th- this whole like navigation thing really is important because um, it actually plays out. I don't think it plays out in more than this one lesson in the in the Civil War, um, and I think it's my heretic opinion for people who are Bolshevik sympathetic. And I know JMC is always always a little bit weary about my Bolshevik sympathies. I, I get it. Um, I'm just, I'm just an angry anti-Leninist. I mean, you can. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I, 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 I won't. I'm never gonna stop being mad about Kronstadt. Um, <laughs> this is, this is, the, this is true, truly elevated left discourse. Just yeah, being yeah, bitter yeah, about yeah, hundred year old grudges. <laughs> like, like, uh, yeah, we're gonna have a Kronstadt debate. I, I'm just gonna mention that Victor Surge probably ended up a reactionary. So, um, just so. Did yeah. it? He he Something he took an he took an Orwell like turn in the end of his life. I don't um, think Donald Orwell was a reactionary either. He oh, was a you, he was a Benthamite. He he wasn't even an Atlantis. He was a Burnamite in 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 1984. Well, he he thought that that was a dystopian analysis that he was trying to prevent. But in Bur- in the review of Burnham, he's not. He's all right. He we're not going to relitigate the 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 uh, the the. the the left sympath, you know, the 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 uh, the left opposition versus libertarian socialists. 
uh, discourse one more time. Yeah. Um, uh, th- my my point actually though is, is this: is that my big my big problem that I think is a fun as a fatal flaw for for what happens with the Bolsheviks is actually extending the faction ban after 1921 and they win the civil war there's no excuse for it mm-hmm. and, um, and that's Stalin. yes and um and it's inconsistent actually with other things lenin said in the past and with things he said later but he didn't undo it um that's that's my big issue on this because there is a time period to break like for example, I talk about the DSA. I don't join the DSA because I don't give I don't give Democrats money. Sorry, I just don't. Um, Fair enough. Uh, I, yeah, that's very justifiable, if you ask me. Um, do, uh, do I oppose people joining the DSA if they're okay with giving Democrats money? Um, but my my thing is, I will work with them until they do certain things, mm-hmm. like. For example, I my line with a lot of people was, "Did you excuse the shit that happened with the railroad strike?" Yep, that's a line. Yep, like so you do have to have it, but like, do I? I know that not everyone in that organization took that line, nor did the organization itself take that line. Although it did cowardly not say anything about it, it kind of half condemned it, but not really. Um, uh, Whereas AOC herself cross that line with the railroad strike. And for me, she did even before with the concentration camps for kids under Biden. And that's why I I went from being like, oh, AOC could be our new FDR. That would be nice to pretty AOC is sus territory, uh, which is not my natural inclination because, you know, I'm all for playing with social Democrats if they play nice. But uh, yeah, it's a character flaw you have. No. Oh. I know, I know. But it, but for me then to be <laughs> the you know fuck you junior partner to the Bidenists, you know what have you done for me lately? Go fuck yourself. That that says something. When but you are on the PSL or on the same side of a question, it's kind of fun. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, so, well, so know, Kyle, the, F- the FSB isn't always wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so Kyle, having walked into two people who have been having a what four year long de- no six year long, you came on my show first time in 2017, 2018, somewhere in there. Terrifying thought, but yeah. When I guess you, when you were like Varn, you need to give the DSA more credit, and I was like, <laughs> Do I? It's, it's it's okay, Varn. Uh, <laughs> me and John Michael also have a six year long running debate about the relative merits of different Kesha albums. That is, uh, true. You just have to not have walked in on. It. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's fair, and it has about as much relevance to the real world as what we're yep. doing right now. <laughs> except that probably more people have stabbed each other recently over Kesha. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, and uh, th- 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 it's, no, nah, nah, it's it's all it's all gravy. It's all gravy as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I mean, which period of Taylor Swift do you like the most? Are you are I'm actually I actually have like no strong opinions about Taylor Swift at all. Like I've never had a strong feeling about a Taylor Swift song <laughs> in would, any I direction. S- I would Either. say early early Swift. I'm a soft. Uh, but I but I am an early I'm an early Kesha fan, which. Uh, I struggle with, you know, that's, that's a difficult one. You know, it's, it's very difficult to be like, to be in 2023, the guy who's like, yeah, TikTok's an incredible song, but like, I mean, but like I think it is, but like, but it's a, it's like a studio product. You could, you could change yeah. out Kesha for anybody. Like, no, no. It, I, well, I mean, it, it's, I'm actually not entirely sure about that because there I'm are other studio get products. Off this, this, this podcast in a minute and listen to John Pine and power violence for an hour, just back and forth. So I actually I can... mostly listen to metal. Uh, yeah. Kesha was Kesha was my happy place during grad school because uh, I was so sick of dealing with all the pretentious like. Where did grad school touch school. you, Kyle? Uh, <laughs> it touched me in the like I can't put up with another fucking party where everybody just kind of stares at their shoes for four hours. Yeah. <laughs> right yeah, I cannot is, do this. <laughs> this is <laughs> That's what Steve, this is Steve calling our our uh, our our podcast decadence into question. Taylor Swift is Karanza, Steve. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. But anyway, no, no. My, that was my, I started that as a joke about like me not really minding 
walking into a really, really bitter long-term leftist <laughs> debate. Uh, that was really the point of that. Thank you, Steve, for calling us out. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, I mean, uh, and the uh, actually it's kind of funny because I didn't even actually get to talk about my uh, the. Uh, so uh, there are two points I always like the, the this thing this magazine this article really I was thinking about so strongly and what really compelled me with it. And one is you know we need to we can look at the CDO as an organization that made a mistake. We don't need to make that mistake again. Nobody needs to make that mistake in the future. I know that they're going to make that mistake in the future because I deal with union organizers and I know how they think and they think like idiots. Uh, so I know that that mistake I is mean, going I, to get made. As a, as a union rep, I cannot confirm or deny yeah. <laughs> but, but you 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 can compare 1199 east you can look at 1199 east and 1199 west and you can be like ooh, ooh yeah, 1199 yeah. west what are you up to uh but um the other point that i that i really find really interesting and compelling is um the porforiata the porforiato i always i'm going to never get the right. i'm so right. sorry yeah. to all the people yeah. that know uh that that that's that liberal technocratic regime, I was not being entirely farcical by comparing it to uh, Pete Buttigieg running the country for, mm -hmm. for 35 years. Like, I'm not being entirely farcical about that. The things that people talk about as being like emblematic of late capitalism have happened before. We're not alone. This is not, I, I, I always have this kind of challenging thing with history where I, I take out, you know, going all the way back to our pre-Socratics, you never step into the same river twice. Every historic moment is unique. Yeah. But I think it is the height of folly to think that our historic moment is uniquely unique. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of differences between us and them. You know, there's not a huge peasant class in the United States. But, you know, they did live under a government that was using, like, there was friendly. We do have a huge town and country divide, though. Holy we shit. We do have a huge town and country divide. We have a huge town and country divide. We have uh, scientific technocratic jackasses who think that, like, following, that, like, attracting exporters and oppressing indigenous groups is how you make, like, a good economy. Uh, that, like, that views any sort of common ownership of anything with profound suspicion and hostility that wants a centralized armed police to handle everything uh, that, you know, believes in law and order at the expense of that justice. Uh, that all those things that people, all these sorts of things that people talk about as being like emblematic of 21st century America that couldn't have happened before were happening in 19th century Mexico. Yeah, things are shitty, and things have been shitty, and things will probably be shitty again. Um, and, and and what I find interesting about this, uh, I, I've I've thought a lot about this because I'm not I'm not a clean stages theory. This is a, this is another <laughs> debate between JMC and I. Uh, I. I'm not a clean stages theory though. Before he accuses me of it, but I, I have noticed the tendency of capital to regress to prior forms that look either like things that existed before it or things that existed at earlier times in its history when things get hard because that's what, and I don't think this is a tendency of capitalism. It is a tendency of people. Like Marx talks yeah. about like, oh, all the revolutions always initially clothe themselves in the image of the last revolution. Look at the English revolution. They were right, clothing right. themselves in the pictures of the Bible. And then like, uh, and and then France is clothing itself in Rome, and and you know I think I think this is a in so much as there is a human tendency that is almost transhistorical. It's not transhistorical because like you know egalitarian uh, immediate immediate uh, surplus eating hunter gatherers don't do this, but but in so much that you have societies that that are civilizational and have classes, they do this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that does mean that we, we this is the thing to learn. And and one of the things I think to learn, one of my big uh, deep in my heart beliefs is uh, both Latin America and Anglo and Anglo North America are settler colonial societies. And despite the difference between between uh, Spain and England as our as our birth parasite, um, uh, that we're a lot more alike than we want to be and mm -hmm. not knowing each other's history. And in this case, it's almost always the Anglos not knowing 
um, not knowing that the, Sp the Spanish speaking and indigenous history is not the other way around. They sure as hell know ours. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and know stuff about it we often don't. Um, it is, is a huge problem because if anything, you know, what is the United States? Okay, it doesn't have a peasantry like this, but it's a highly decentralized, highly federalized society that is as often at odds with itself as with outsiders. Um, that is culturally disunified in ways that are not obvious, but become very obvious when you try to impose central order. Um, and who has a profound town and country divide that is now literally driving like early death rates. Um, you know, maybe looking at things like China and, and Mexico are actually better proxies than anything in Europe. Yeah. yeah and, and what I would say is that something that is pretty clear to me, um, you know, having a lot of, I'm, I'm not Mexican myself. I'm half Puerto Rican and half Colombian. But for some reason, I have a lot of Mexican connections and have made a lot of Mexican friends in the, the, the years that I've visited there. Um, and one of the things that's obvious to me every time that I go is that the Mexican Revolution is still alive in Mexico. It's not a simple past historical event that nobody cares about. There's, You can still get a bourgeois person amped up about how the Porfirio Diaz regime should never have been overthrown, you know, and we'd all be so much richer. Or somebody saying that Zapata, you know, the was current right. president is Obrador. Yeah, yeah, that's, like, that's right. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean the PRI and its century-long dictatorship, all it never in a certain way it never ended because all the subsequent political parties are PRI spinoffs, you know. Right, um, the Pons a PRI spinoff, even uh, even Amlo's. Parties, pre well, it's and actually, Amos had to make some coalitions that you know include parts of the pre too. So. Yeah, it's actually worse than that because the the so Amlo got his start in this party called the PFRD, the PRD, and that was the left wing of the pre initially, the uh, the so called um, uh, the so called Cardenistas. I had to look mm -hmm. up his name because uh, there was this guy called Cardenas who was like the uh, the 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 left wing faction of the pre in the thirties that did like a corp a corporatist planned economy welfare state kind of deal, um, the uh, albeit like you know while crushing any socialists and anarchists and so on in the trade unions, um, so the uh, the the you know like like and then and then Amlo spun off Mo, uh, Morena which is his current party from the PPD so that's like you know so so. Everyone still has opinions on the Mexican Revolution in Mexico. The factions basically all have descendants today. The Zapatistas have their descendants in the – not just the neo Zapatistas of 1994, the famous EZLN that took over uh, large parts of Chiapas. But actually the, there's a larger – and this is what Americans don't really understand – and a larger indigenous movement uh, organized around the Congreso Nacional Indígena in Mexico that is not just – the EZLN, but is also a bunch of like uh, municipalities and indigenous groups that have kind of broken off their own kind of local autonomy. So one of the most famous cities is Cheran, which is not in um, in Chiapas. I think it's in Oaxaca, if I recall correctly. Yes, in Oaxaca, but it, I believe. Yeah, but it's it's uh, it's it's another one of these free cities that's basically just done. It, it, it got rid of the political parties and the cops and does direct democracy with its own. Uh, self defense patrols and stuff. So and it so, led to a mini civil war in Michoacan when someone tried to do that. Right, like with exactly. The Federalists versus the Indignagas versus the uh, versus Cartels. the Templars, the Templar cartel. Yeah. yeah, and and the thing, so the thing about this, right, is that like this is a living history. Uh, this is the the so part of the reason to know this is because you know if. God forbid, and I don't want this, but it looks like it's pro it, there's a good chance that it'll happen. If things break down in the United States, right, we need, we, the, the left, people who believe in democracy, need all the allies that we can get. A lot of those allies are going to be in Mexico, right? So we should, we should make friends and know our friends and learn the language and learn their history just like they've learned ours. Um, but another reason to know this history is because it has analogies to our own. Even if we don't have a peasantry, we do have a working class that's divided by sectors and divided by race and religion. And that 
create similar problems, some of which I've kind of outlined with my um, DSA and stupid poll and, and so on, identitarian religious examples. Um, you know, so so even if the uh, the actual sort of divides within and between uh, the working class or the sectors of the working class are different, you know, at the end of the day, because all successful socialist movements have been coalitions, which speaking of which, that's also a truth that is very difficult to get from Marxist theory, but makes itself incredibly apparent immediately as you look at history. Um, the uh, is that is that there's no such thing as a single revolutionary subject that is unified and monolithic and united under a single party that then does all the things that need to be done, whether within a democratic system or you know or or in a one party state. That is not how the thing ever works. Like. Even the party states require coalitions of different sectors to get on board them, right? Like, I mean, think of uh, the, the Workers, Peasants, Soldiers Alliance of classical kind of Leninist uh, sloganeering. Um, the, uh, it's the same thing regardless of whether you're in a civil war situation or a reformist situation or a direct action situation. It's the same thing. You need to build coalitions across different sectors, and that's going to involve a sector that, you know, we Nowadays, we've taken to calling it after Aaron Reich, the professional managerial class, you know, maybe that's just the white collar sector of the working class or the labor aristocracy, or maybe it's a class unto itself descended from the old petty bourgeoisie, you know, whatever it is. I mean, I, I was born into it. I was born upper middle class from ascended working class parents. Um, the, uh, the, and I know enough to know based on kind of like socialist organizing, talking to friends, both from my class and from the working class properly so-called that, and looking at history that, they need, you know, the movement needs people who, from the PMC, and it needs people from the working class, and not just the working class, but the working classes. What's left of industrial manufacturing, which is actually quite a lot in the U.S., uh, what's uh, the uh, the agrarian working class, particularly if the way that we're going is some kind of civil war dictatorship, because whoever then controls the food controls uh, political legitimacy, right? Um, you know the, and you need uh, and you need the service sector. You do like it's it's not uh, strategically uh, the 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 thing that Marxists like to talk about, but to the extent that one can speak of like the majority of the working class, it's like undocumented immigrant women service workers, you know, in in the in the domestic sector and retail, right? I mean, like that's the quintessential kind of Gabe Winnet new work. Last thing. These are different sectors with different cultures. The ethnic groups and the religious groups cut across them in different ways. And we need to be able to build coalitions across them that don't compromise on our core egalitarian values, right? It's not about throwing anybody under the bus to in order to get some other demographic on board. But while maintaining our principles, we need to be able to create that coalition. Otherwise, we lose. You know, this is not like a moral point about how great it would be if we could all sing around a campfire kumbaya. This is the nitty gritty, difficult politics of what it takes to actually have power so that the bastards who currently have all the power don't just shoot us. Like, that's what it would take. And I think that there's a fundamental immaturity in the way that a lot of these questions are discussed online, even very important questions, uh, you know, having to do with like what line we should take on things like the rise of the post-left Peter Thiel thing or the or on identitarianism, which I do think actually has to be opposed in a principled way from the left. These are serious discussions undertaken in an incredibly unserious register by people chasing social media clout online um, in their podcasts or in their journalism careers, not principled debates about movements that are trying to do what's best for everybody in our egalitarian political coalition. And I think that that is, you know, not to our credit because it's a great deal of the reason why we're stuck, but hopefully looking at historical case studies, like the one that, that Kyle and I have, have tried to sketch out in the Mexican case um, is a kind of sobering effect. So that this like, you know, clout chasing online social dynamic nonsense or the kind of high theoretical like woo woo you know like like value form posturing all of these kind of like recede a little bit and you get down into the nitty-gritty of like who are the factions what do they stand for who can we work with who must we defeat you know and um um and what is the balance of forces and, you know the range of possibilities in the immediate future that's the kind of discussion that i want to have that's what i think historical materialism would look like um so, yeah. But the question is, JMC, did anyone ask you? No. Um, uh, 
<laughs> I mean, technically, I did ask you. Um, so, um, no, I think this is actually that last point is something that I think a lot about. Like, what do we learn from this? Uh, what do we learn from this past? What do we learn from our own lives? And I don't just mean in this, like this facile lived experience way, not totally I'm not against lived experiences either that's one input you take in upon many um but in like a very like what do we do how do we do it who can you trust and who can't you trust and i can tell you that the left whatever the fuck that is um everyone's favorite floating signifier um is uh, does not know right now. And and I, I do think that is why in these, quote, unserious discussions, which I think are, I think you're right, J, JMC, they are unserious, but they have serious consequences because yeah. it's not just because they tie us to not being able to do anything, although they do do that as well, but because, like, incoherence breeds monsters. Mm. Um, we are producing a generation of people who have very strange ideological notions who might one day, if they are not totally deracinated by our current society, be leaders in ways that are dangerous. And um, I would rather just win them over now <laughs> than have to fight them later. <laughs> um, but I also think what, you know, I guess the long and short of it, and this is where we can end off, and then I'll let you do the weird petite bourgeois thing we have to do at the end of all these shows, um, which I have to do at the end of every show because that's how you pay off people to come on your show when you're not, you know, a mega million podcast. Uh, um, it is, it is the following: like we have to take a realistic view of why it's important not to throw people under the bus. And and also, like, understanding just in a very simple... Like, I, I'm actually shocked at how simple this is to explain to people, and yet people don't get it. Like, the right can move right. In, in America, Joe Manchin can become a Republican. AOC cannot... Until socialists have an independent identity, I'm not even talking about a party. I'm just an independent identity, a real independent identity. There is no one to protect someone like AOC from being a defector. And all the logic is already there for her to do so. So empowering those people before you have an independent identity is literally sheepdogging yourself. Like, it's like, please take advantage of me. Make me... Make me your willing pawn and do nothing when people attack us. Um, and this has also been true for various identity groups. You want to talk about identity politics? We definitely see it. Um, Etc. And that's the lesson that we can learn from this specific instance of the Mexican Revolution. Um, and, uh, and maybe, like, let's be responsible and have the conversation in a real way and treat each other as, like, at least for now, comrades. Um, because, you know, honestly, none of us are going to get to put everybody we want to put against the wall against the wall anyway. And if we are, we're probably going to be put against the wall ourselves very quickly. Dialectics of Saturn style. Um, to use a phrase from Dominic Lacerdo, not my favorite person, but um, which is the phrase about the, the, what the dialectics of Saturn is, just to explain it, is the revolution eating its own children. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's not my style. I don't like eating. Uh, uh, people are not kosher or halal. So um, we're going to end on that note. And on that weirdly cannibalistic image, what do you guys want to plug? <laughs> I want to plug our magazine, Strange yes. Matters Magazine. It is a uh, it is a cooperatively owned enterprise uh, where us editors are not 
fucking getting paid. I, I, the money you give us goes entirely towards distribution and paying authors to write wonderful articles. Like again, well, I mean, this Mexico face wasn't paid for, uh, but you know, we 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 get labor diaries of people who work at McDonald's or in the music industry in the '90s. We get economic analyses of what World War II spending can tell us about the current state of the Federal Reserve. We get really funny articles about uh, trying to understand cryptids from a European perspective. Uh, we Wait, get a what? one... Yeah, that one's really fun. <laughs> that one's upcoming. That one's not out yet. But that one's that fun. Yeah. The, uh, that, that, one, that one's upcoming. That was fun. I like that one. Uh, we, we get a person who, who did a personal reported journey of going to that insane Noah's Ark Museum. Yeah, uh, yeah, it exists in the. Uh, oh my god, what state is it? I forget. The uh, yeah. the and and um. Work recently, adventure, yeah, it's real. Recently, we just published uh, Matt uh, in her. Yes, work that one's wonderful. Review of Safi Faye's film. Safi Faye being a um. Senegalese. Maker, yeah, from from Senegal, um, who helped pioneer the uh, the Senegalese film industry. So um, you know, we're our second issue is coming out like basically in the next couple weeks so if you subscribe now to the print subscription level you'll get a beautiful copy um i don't have issue one next to me right now hey actually oh, i do it? hold on let me grab it i got it oh, okay good yeah so this is number one and number two will be coming out soon uh so it's beautiful number one is why when when i do these shows by the way if you guys haven't noticed the change i've actually put a different one up today but usually it's a yellow stripe that's because of the of issue one but i realize you guys might change color eventually and it's gonna yeah. totally screw up my plan the, the color is the color we are less we are less uh married to the color than to uh the bizarre insane modernism yeah. okay so, uh, so so my new joint logo up here uh, which I'm previewing for all of you, uh, okay. where it's multicolored and it's the weird squiggly thing that you. It's wonderful. Have. Yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, that, that is now our official uh, joint project uh, branding. Uh, Love it. Is uh, thank you very much for that. Wayne both yeah. um, And and so. yeah, like like I know that subscribing can be difficult. Um, we 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 try to we tried to price it at a level that like you know is kind of like a podcast Patreon level in the lowest ones that are digital only. Uh, but, you know, like Kyle said, all the money does go to writers after overhead. Uh, so, you know, like, and, and we're trying to pay people slightly above the market rate that that exists for magazines of our size. Um, it's, you know, a labor of love. And we're, we're trying to put together stuff that is both brings us delight, you know, on the philosophy and culture side, but then is also like just concretely useful uh, to, to, to social movements, whether it's like journalism from Palestine. Um, or or reporting about the, uh, the 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 euthanasia program and how it's being used for austerity in Canada and stuff like that. So, uh, uh, and I I sincerely believe that we are publishing some of the best economic analyses out there. Yeah, I think so too. The uh, I, I genuinely think we are just, just flat out. I I think that I think we're we're doing. If if you are the type of person who looks at the Financial Times or the Economist and just gets fucking mad, we're the people for you. Yeah. Well, I mean, so yeah, the Financial that's, Times that's is better than the Economist, but yes, it's true. Uh, I, I mean yes, but <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, um, uh, yeah, I, I will second that. You guys do interest. Actually, you're one of the few venues where um, different kinds of economic theorists talk to each other. Yes, um, that's very intentional. We want all it's very stuff. intentional. It, it is it is a piece of outright theory, and John Michael wrote an extremely long article for issue two. Uh, cal uh, you know, re uh, really clarifying this theory that uh, the mainstream economists are not only wrong, they are extremely narrow minded. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not even wrong in interesting or potentially productive directions like other economic, like other academic disciplines. They are wrong because they subscribe to only one very narrow minded set of theories that are provably and repeatedly false, but they have focused laser like on purging economics departments of people who do things intelligent yeah and uh issue two you besides that piece on on this economist fred lee you you can by me you can also look forward to a friend of the barn vlog uh suda uh wrote a city profile of jersey city which is excellent uh, and goes into the political economy and recent politics of that city under a kind of neoliberal gentrificationist regime um 
the the uh, the, the the creationist uh, uh, Noah's Ark tour uh, by uh, by Nathan Hillgardner. Um, uh, oh my gosh, I actually forget what's in it because I'm. Uh, oh, the cryptid piece by 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 Madison Rose. Uh, that's about the the famous Toledo cryptid, the Toledo, Ohio. That is, which you, if you haven't heard of it, then that's okay. Uh, you'll learn, and uh, and all sorts of stuff. Oh, a uh, dinosaurs, Dayton Martindale. Uh, great ecological journalist um i was about to say you guys need to get more ecology in there that's my only critique so far oh, oh yeah uh, congratulations you're getting ecology we heard your complaint and we commissioned that piece like eight months ago oh good yeah yeah <laughs> that's our one downside is that we're so slow because we're a, we're a small volunteer operation basically uh but we're we're trying to get better on that hopefully we'll have two numbers two full print issues this year uh, this one and one in the second half, uh, combined with, of course, uh, online content usually every other week, um, and sometimes more frequently. So yeah, that's that's the pitch. And uh, if you like this kind of thing, uh, then please consider giving us money because uh, it will go straight into the pockets of the writers who produce it. Yeah, um, and they have paperwork proving that. So good, good on you. Um, uh, I. Uh, I am a subscriber. Uh, I don't know if I'm still a subscriber. I may have subscribed only for the first year, so I might need to fix that. Um, and uh, I would, I would totally endorse things. Uh, my, my, my challenge to leftist is read widely, uh, and left and non-left journals. I sometimes actually read compact. I know I don't give them money. Don't feel bad, JMC. Um, uh, well, I mean, I, I read, I read them in American Affairs too. That's how I know what's in it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Me too. Uh, I, I read Monthly Review, um, even though sometimes it makes my blood pressure grow up. I read Jacobin, even though sometimes it makes my heart rate go absurdly high. Um, I've uh, stopped reading Jacobin. It's been a, it's been like a good six months since I've opened up one of its articles. <laughs> That's my that's my vice. I, I I don't know. Is there did I miss anything? Yeah, they, they, they had one good realization recently that like what everyone else, including in these times, realized and what I realized many years ago about uh, property investment and union leadership was actually a problem and a thing. Although they only realized it after the railroad union thing. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, cool. that, and that independent report that came out that actually in these times talked about. But uh which, by sense. the way, might no longer be a problem soon since the bond market might collapse. So, uh, depending on A, what happens in, in world geopolitics, and B, actually more importantly, uh, how nihilistic are the Republicans? Are they really willing to destroy U.S. dollar hegemony to own the libs? Which I think, maybe. Um, but we'll talk about that after the apocalypse happens. So... Um, uh yeah and so definitely check it out read widely read strange matters magazine even if you're not a libertarian socialist um um and uh uh read you know read everything you can um uh and if you don't like reading ebooks or your friends are, are uh what i mean chat audio books is what you're looking for yeah audiobooks ebooks audiobooks whatever chat gpt can read to you probably um actually there that is now. there is actually if you have a pdf version of something there's this great app called voice stream that actually does read it to you in soothing little voices that you can modulate the speed and which voice it is so i was yeah text, text to speech stuff is fairly good these days it's no yeah. longer just microsoft sam i always pick the british lady and then i just go of go in a bad view yeah, of course. Yeah. That's that's what makes you a traitor to America. Yeah, uh, me, me and Varner are out here siding with the Mexican revolutionaries, and you're out there dragging and, um, us back to the, the, and to the colonial bubble glory. Bath, and I'm in my bubble bath with my red wine as a champagne socialist, uh, listening. Yeah, to yeah I'm a real working class socialist. I take showers. Yeah, listen. Uh, this is the class divide. Yeah, listen, you base? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is the. This is the narrated by the, this is the yeah this is the this is the dialectic uh, all right all right uh the, yeah. the problem is we all like each other too much even though yeah. you know like i'm probably gonna purge you all but um 
Um, I, I, I will appreciate the single teardrop while you while you purge us. Uh, Koba, uh, why must you kill me? <laughs> I probably there's other way. You don't have to kill someone to purge them. You could just put them in a basement somewhere and throw food down there every now. And then. But um, <laughs> you'll go, yeah, the, the new purge is oubliettes. Yeah, we're gonna. <laughs> that's the impact the paradox games has had. We are getting far afield here. We have made yeah, we our plugs. Stop. It's time to it's time to kill this. All right. Uh, yeah, Bard, uh, it's your show. You get to kill it. Yes. Uh, and with that note, um, we uh, if you want to give me money, you can, but you don't have to. This is available for free uh, and will remain so. Um, if, Do it. Give him money. Um, but uh, I'll take money. I'm not going to complain too much about it. Um, and go subscribe to Strange Matters Magazine. Uh, read widely. Uh Join a union, even though they probably aren't great when you're in there, but do it because we need you to fight. And um, I don't know. Learn shit. Bye.